Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants, the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples, who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area, and pay respect to the elders, past and present, of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? Mr President, I table documents pursuant to statute and returns to order as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? The clerk. And committees have lodged proposals as shown at item three of today's order of business. I remind senators the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, we shall move on and I'll call the clerk. Government business order of the day number one, Fair Work Amendment supporting Australia's Jobs and Economic Recovery Bill 2021, a resumption of second reading debate. Thank you, Mr. President. In the Senator Lyons. Sorry. Last five minutes I've got back, I really do want to focus on the elements of the bill that Labor find well, we find the whole bill unpalatable, but particularly the casual worker clause. And seriously, I do recall at the start of this conversation the Attorney General saying this was about making it fair for workers. It seemed to me at that point that the Morrison government had recognised that workers on the front line during the pandemic, aged care workers, early childhood educators, cleaners, security officers, paramedics, a whole lot of people had very precarious employment. Many were employed on casuals. Many had less than full-time work, and we've seen that with security officers in charge of our hotel quarantine. And I thought at that point there was some hope that the Morrison government, for once and for all, was going to fix up the casual worker clause. But sadly, I've been mistaking, and disappointingly, so have thousands and thousands of workers across Australia who saw an opportunity that the Morrison government might fix this and fix their employment. But sadly, if this bill goes through this place today, each and every one of those Morrison government senators and MPs who vote for this bill, along with whoever from the crossbench support them, will be the ones that condemn Australian workers, casuals in particular, to continued insecure employment to continue not knowing how many hours a week they're going to get, from getting a message from their employer on their text, via text, come to work, don't come to work. This is not a respectful way to treat workers. It is time in this country, we like to pride ourselves and say that we're a fair country, it is time in this country that we treated the lowest paid in our community with fairness and with respect and with dignity. And I would urge the crossbench today, who have yet to make up their mind from all accounts in the media, that it's not too late to do the right thing by Australian workers. And you know what? Bosses will survive this. They will. Their businesses are not going to crash to the wall because they have to give permanent employment to casuals after a period of time. And at the moment, what's being proposed by the Morrison government, and it's a sham, is that you can be made casual after six months. But if the boss doesn't do it, you've got no recourse. There is no recourse for you to go to a court and argue in a fair way to get a fair go. So we, in this place today, have that opportunity within our hands to fix life for casual workers, to fix it once and for all, to make it secure, because those people that uh, took this country forward during the pandemic deserve deserve at least that at least that now of course there's a lot of other things that are wrong with the bill but that's uh, in my experience as a union official that's what stands out for me to see women who are scraping by uh, looking after families not knowing from week to week what their take-home pay will be we know in this country 
There are way too many children living in poverty. And if the Morrison government agrees to this casual clause today and those in the crossbench who agree with them, that's what you will be doing. You'll be condemning a generation of children to poverty. And I would urge you to take a long, hard look at this and change it, because we want fairness. And that's where this debate started. It started with trying to make the pandemic better for employers, and the trade union movement agreed at that time and agreed to some temporary changes. But now it seems we're trying to lock those changes in forever, and it is not on. And if you do that in here today, the Australian public will punish you at the voting box, and you will deserve to be punished for condemning uh, low-paid workers to uh, insecure work forever and a day. It is not on. Do the right thing, do the fair thing, and I urge the crossbench not to agree to the amendments uh, and the bill that the government wants to put up today. Uh, listen to the ACTU. Listen to workers out there. There's so much out on social media this today about people's personal stories, about how life is so hard for them. Don't do this to a yet another generation of workers. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise to speak on the Fair Work Amendment supporting Australia's Job and Economic Recovery Bill uh, on behalf of, uh, and make a contribution to the second reading debate. Mr. President, there, uh, De Deputy President, there are few certainties in life, and I think those, we, as we have all lived through 2020, we certainly know that for sure. But you know one thing we can always count on? We can always count on the Liberal Party taking any, any opportunity they can to e make it easier to es exploit Australian working families. You see, despite their rhetoric, those on the other side have never been on the side of Australian working families. Most of the time they feel they need to hide it. They have to hide their contempt. They have to hide their true intentions. But you know there are moments when they show their true colours. They show what they really think and what they really want to do. There's a couple of times they thought they could get away with it. I was here in, uh, after 2004 when John Howard won a majority in both houses, and the Howard li Liberals thought they were permanent. They thought they were inv invincible. They finally had the confidence, therefore, to reveal they were not on the side of working Australians and that they never had been. And what did they do? They ran through the extreme work choices law. Well, Australians got the message right away and sent the Howard government packing. Since then, the Liberals have been trying extra hard to hide their stripes. But you know, their stripes don't change. And now here we are again, a second time, with a Liberal government that feels unassailable, that takes Australians for granted, that feels it's permanent, that thinks that the collective goodwill and trust in government that's generated by our shared response to the pandemic means they can get away with things that they never normally get away with. Well, once again, they will be proven wrong. You see what the coalition have misunderstood about these times, about how we have all pulled together through this pandemic, is that Australians have seen as clearly as ever what matters. Australians want good, secure jobs with fair paying conditions. Australians want cheaper childcare. Australia wa Australians want to live in a country that makes things and supports local jobs, and they want to live in an Australia where no one is held back and no one is left behind. Australians want a government that's on their side. But what have they got instead? <laughs> well, Australians have a government that never delivers for anyone other than themselves a government that isn't on their side, a government that will leave hundreds of thousands of Australians behind when it ends JobKeeper this month, that makes fundamental parts of life for working families like childcare just too expensive, a government of broken promises, sports rorts, dodgy self-dealing and a trillion dollars of debt with what to show for it, a government that has overseen worsening job security and a government that cuts wages as they do with this bill. Now, Labor has set a very simple test. We would support this legislation if it delivered secure jobs with decent pay. But the government's legislation, even with the amendments it grudgingly made, still fails that test. I'll return to the provisions of the bill in a moment. But I do want to make the point that it doesn't have to be this way. 
Labor has set out our plan for more job security, better pay and a fairer industrial relations system. Because unlike those opposite, we understand that being in secure work means people can build a future for themselves and for their families. They can get a bank loan to buy a home. They can take leave when they're sick or need to look after those they love without putting their jobs at risk. This is a better deal on offer. Job security, better pay, a fairer system. Job security explicitly inserted into the Fair Work Act. Rights for gig economy workers through the Fair Work Commission. Casual work properly defined in law. A crackdown on cowboy labour hire firms to guarantee same job, same pay. Pretty simple proposition. A cap on back-to-back short-term contracts for the same role. More secure public sector jobs by ending inappropriate temporary contracts. <clears throat> government contracts to companies and organisations that offer secure work for their employees. And, of course, we must tackle the gender pay gap. Labor's plan will require companies with more than 250 employees to report their gender pay gap publicly. Our plan would prohibit pay secrecy clauses and give employees the right to disclose their pay if they want to. And we will take action to address the gender pay gap in the Australian public service by ensuring we will ensure that the Fair, Fair, Fair Work Commission has strengthened powers to order pay increases for workers in low-paid female-dominated industries. And Labor will legislate a right to 10 days paid family and domestic violence leave. The singular driving purpose of this parliament should be how we improve the lives of the Australian people. And that is why we make no apology on this side of the chamber for standing in the way of legislation that makes life harder for working Australians. And we make no apology for wanting casual workers to have the same basic workplace rights that the rest of the workforce rightly enjoys. You see, under Mr Morrison, job insecurity has worsened. Gig workers regularly get paid below minimum wage, the minimum wage in unsafe conditions. What does this bill do? In an act of political opportunism, this bill uses the COVID pandemic to entrench the epidemic of job insecurity. You see, what we know, COVID-19, didn't create the problems we're seeing in our society, the inequality, the low wages, poor working conditions. But what it did do is this. It shone a light. It shone a light onto realities that have been ignored by this government for every day they have been in power. And at a time where some in our lowest paid industries have borne the brunt of the pandemic, what is the thanks they get from the Morrison government? What is the thanks they get? The government thanks them. Mr Morrison thanks them by allowing their pay to be cut. The thanks of a grateful Prime Minister. Casual workers. Well, we know casual workers carried this nation through the pandemic. You know who they are? There are aged care workers, our hospitality workers, our retail workers, food producers, delivery drivers, and many of them are casual in name only, having worked in the same essential role for years, but without getting the sort of job security that is so fundamental uh, to providing for yourself long term and for your family. This bill will shackle these workers into the definitions and conditions imposed on them the day they started work. Under the proposed schedule 50, Section 15A in Schedule 1 of this bill, if an employer tells a worker they're casual on day one, this employment definition persists and prevails, even if, though, through the performance, even if through the performance of their role the worker has a set roster, a pattern of regular and consistent hours, and even if there's an expectation of ongoing and stable work. But true to form, the Morrison government is going even further. This section aims to have a retrospective application. The effect of that is those who were wrongly classified as casual employees remain shackled to that definition irrespective of the years of work history to the contrary. So you're not only doing people now, you're going back to do them over. This provision ignores real world practice and turns back many years of legal precedent. When the courts expanded the rights of workers by examining the employment relationship beyond merely what was enclosed within the express terms inside a few pages, this bill seeks to take them away. Those opposite claim their inclusion of casual conversion provisions fixes the issue of insecure work. But you know what? You always have to read the fine print with this government, especially with this Minister for Industrial Relations. Because when you read these proposed changes closely, you, you will see an employer is able to reject requests for conversion to part-time or full-time work 
on so-called reasonable grounds, and the worker can only dispute a rejection if the employer agrees to go to the Fair Work Commission for arbitration. <laughs> so, casual aged care worker requests conversion. Employer says, no, I can't do that. And she or he has to go to the Commission for Arbitration. Yeah, that's going to happen, isn't it? That's a good way to deal with it. No understanding of the disparity of power in the relationship. No understanding. Or maybe, actually, they do understand. Maybe they do understand, which is why they draft these provisions in this way. On wage theft. Well, this bill is consistent with the government pa patent, government's pattern of lagging behind the states. While wage theft provisions may at first glance be, look to be a step forward, if you're in Queensland or Victoria from the 1st of July, they're a step back. This bill would prevail over existing state legislation. So if you're in Queensland where fraudulent falsification of records is a crime, the bill overrides that protection. The Victorian and Queensland legislation has a 10-year maximum sentence. This bill will reduce that to four years. So for millions of Australian workers, the Morrison government is reducing their protections against wage theft, reducing the deterrence to engage in it. See, the bill criminalises wage theft in theory only and sets a bar so high that very few prosecutions could meet it. And we know that if wage theft is not prosecuted, it prevails and persists, most often in the form of taking advantage and exploiting our most vulnerable workers. Madam Deputy President, Australia's workers have dem demonstrated enormous good faith and solidarity through the pandemic by agreeing to greater flexibility in the workplace to help save livelihoods. These so-called JobKeeper amendments to the Fair Work Act were concessions made with the understanding that we were living in unprecedented times. They enabled businesses in receipt of JobKeeper to alter core aspects of, employee, of an employee's work. They were provisions agreed to in good faith. You know, decent discussions, a decent position taken by the Australian trade union movement and those they represent. And what has this government done? What they've sought to do under Mr Morrison is to take advantage of that good faith and take away protections workers have fought for and won over decades. This government wants to let businesses that never even had a job keep, JobKeeper change, where workers Sorry, this government wants to let businesses that never even had JobKeeper change where a worker works or even what a worker does, not during this pandemic, but for two years. And if that level of insecurity wasn't enough, Schedule 2 of this bill plainly legislates pay cuts, enabling an employer to ask the employee to work additional hours without payment for overtime. Really? I mean, in the face of that, that decency, this is what you do? At a time where work is scarce and JobKeeper and JobSeeker are ending, how many workers, you reckon, are going to be able to say no to that? Nothing in this bill seeks to increase wages or empower workers, and the enterprise bargaining changes in particular seek to take advantage of workers by masking true intentions in complicated legal jargon. Again, no surprise from this minister. We know that an agreement cannot contradict the national employment standards. In fact, agreements must ensure they reflect the minimums contained within those standards. What this bill seeks to do is allow employers to insert a clause which purports that they comply with the NES, but at the same time as letting them include clauses which do not meet that bare minimum threshold. And even though these clauses are illegal, they remain in agreements. And after all of that, the bill seeks to prevent a union stepping up and warning this isn't OK. Because if a union hasn't been part of a bargaining process before the agreement reaches the Commission, there will be no mechanism for the union to represent workers' concern. So all of this adds up to less scrutiny, less transparency, worse outcomes for workers. And if these realities weren't poor enough, it's worse still for workers engaged in major multinational projects, in constructions or FIFO workers. They face the prospect of being locked into greenfields agreements, agreements for eight years without recourse. Eight years is a pretty long time. Pretty long time to be unable to visit, revisit wage increases which have failed to keep up with the cost of living or address safety issues in the workplace. But it is what you'd expect from a government that considers pressing wage growth to be a core objective of their economic policy. 
The catch cry of this pandemic was, we are all in this together. And at the height of the pandemic, Mr Morrison established working group processes designed to make it look like they were interested in what working Australians wanted. And they are trying to spin that this legislation is, is the result of working groups involving unions representing workers. But the entire movement representing working Australians opposes this bill. You know what the true spirit of this legislation is? It's not we're all in this together. It's you're on your own. And now, just as they did after John Howard's work choices, Australians will have a choice between a smug, tired party that governs for themselves and a government that is on their side, where no one is held back and no one is left us behind. An Australia with job security, better pay and a fairer system. But that will only come if we elect a Labor government. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I say, what a mess. Industrial relations, IR, in Australia is a mess. But there has been unexpected universal agreement that the real problem is the Fair Work Act. The Fair Work Act is the culprit. Uni union bosses agree with me. Dave Noonan was in my office two days ago. National Secretary of the CFMEU agrees with me. This is a mess. He said, quote, Fair Work Act has not protected wages and conditions. The ACTU's Sally McManus and Michelle O'Neill in my office yesterday agree with me. Major employer groups agree with me. Small business agrees with me. How the hell can a small business person and, and employers, good workers, possibly recognise what their rights and entitlements are? The Gillard Rudd Fair Work Act has led to union decline, poor business leadership and management, and a loss of worker rights. These leaders, business and unions, ag agreed to an invitation from me to continue this discussion. As this bill is, though, we cannot support it. We have many substantive amendments and many technical amendments that will need to be accepted before we can consider this bill. Let's have a look at some key facts. Australia's largest employer of workers is small business—830,000 workers. In Australia, we have, across many sectors, 2.5 million casuals with diverse needs, including flexibility and options. Unions in the private sector now account for just 9 per cent of the workers. Now, we will protect that 9 per cent, and we will work for the, other, the rest of the 100 per cent and for small business. Remember, only investors, employers and workers create jobs. We have three aims in addressing this bill. To protect honest workers, protect small business and restore our productive capacity in Australia. We want jobs, confidence, certainty, security, workers' rights, protections and fairness. We've invited more than 80 groups to come and talk to us. We invited them in writing. We've talked to more than 100 groups, some twice. We are listening widely. We've had ideas from the ACTU, unions, employers. We asked, what about small business? Hush silence. Now, I want to point out something else too. We have rejected the government's Ensuring Integrity 2 bill. We were slammed in the media, slammed by the unions, slammed, uh, slammed by the government, sorry. And now employers are coming to us and saying, we did the right thing. In the past, we also took the other view we supported the ABCC, the ROC and the Ensuring Integrity 1. We don't take sides, we get the facts. There are five key areas in this bill. Casuals. Everyone has ignored this problem for six years, Labor and Liberal. Simon Turner, who is now totally and permanently disabled, and others in the Hunter Valley were crushed emotionally and some crushed physically, discarded. Stuart Bonds came to their rescue in the Hunter. Now, I grew up in the Hunter. I worked as an underground coalface miner and as a mine manager. I worked with the Hunter Valley CFMEU in the 1980s as a member and then as a manager and argued with them and respected each other. I pushed, in coming back to the present, I've pushed for justice and entitlements for Simon Turner for 21 months and will continue pushing. He suffered under a dodgy initial employment breach of award, then under an EA that came from a faulty process, enterprise agreement. Yet the union, the Hunter Valley CFMEU, approved that EA enterprise agreement and surrendered rights to complain. Joel Fitzgibbon, the Labor member, ignored six letters from Simon begging for help. 
And then Joel Fitzgibbon misrepre misrepresented me and the problem in the Hunter. The Labor Party has failed, although I acknowledge that Tony Sh S Senator Sheldon has, has uh, done some work in that area, but come up against a brick wall. The Liberal Nats have failed, although I acknowledge the Attorney General and Senator Maurice Payne for doing something there. Senator Murray Watt has blown in from Queensland and now mentions the Hunter Valley in Newcastle. Where was he for 21 months? Where was he for the last six years? The union has failed. The Liberal Nats New South Wales ministers have failed. The employer groups, the New South Wales and Australian Minerals Council, have failed. They're not even interested. But there is a shining light. Alex Bukarika, the CFMEU Mining Division's legal counsel, has said, and I applaud his courage and integrity because he had acknowledged my words about what's happening in the Hunter and how the workers have been sold out. Let's talk about the Hunter Valley CFMEU. They started casuals back in the 80s when I was a mine manager and then became an employer. They had good intentions but they became an employer. They became later a major shareholder in Tessa and negotiated enterprise agreements for Tessa. The Hunter Valley CFMEU made big money when it sold its company to Tessa. It reportedly sold enterprise agreements with shelf companies. It approved enterprise agreements that exploit miners. It facilitated, negotiated, approved and recommended more than 300 enterprise agreements containing casuals. Yet the Black Coal Mining Industry Award has no, no casuals in working in, in production, only permanents. The Hunter Valley CFMU enabled casuals, drove casualisation and now denigrates casuals while, while not protecting them from their claims of injuries and serious safety violations. I have lost respect for the Hunter Valley branch of the CFMEU, and it also shows that the industrial relations system is broken. Let's look at the bigger picture. The CFMEU fought for amalgamation, and now the mining division wants to pull out. What's going on? The CFMEU funded GetUp, and GetUp's main campaign is to stop coal mining, destroy jobs. Look at the Hayden Royal Commission, the CFMEU, the, H the HSU scandal, stealing from some of the lowest paid workers in the country, their own members the SDA and doing dodgy enterprise agreements, selling out to multinationals, the AWU doing the same. Under the Fair Work Act, Fair Work Act the unions have failed. Workers have lost their protections. In Queensland, the CFMEU and the Mining Division has been admirably honest. Shane Brunker in Townsville said, yes, we have to start doing better care with the, CF, with the uh, casuals. Jim Lamley was a union delegate, vice president in the CFMEU mining division back in the 1990s. He said then the union was being overtaken by politics and personal agenda and needs to get back to service. Speaking of service, there is a union growing in membership, growing rapidly despite Anastasia Palaszczuk trying to pull them back. That's the Nurses Professional Association of Queensland, and it focuses on service and lower fees. So how did Casual start? Well, small business uses casuals and has quite well, and many employees want to be casuals, hundreds of thousands of them, because today workers want options and flexibility. Small business needs options and flexibility. Everyone won on that one, and small business needs a big cut in paperwork. And then the grubby global, globalist BHP, with a history of managerial incompetence in the coal sector, laughed at in coal by suppliers, workers, unions, labour hire, by its own workforce. It adopted casual as a way of getting around this. We have seen managers now in many industries focusing not on working, making work easier and more productive but on complying with rules. Australian business leadership is poor, it doesn't listen, it doesn't connect and it instead it goes on rules. The root cause of Australia's industrial relations law complexity and the IR club, the industrial relations club, live off this monster. The Fair Work Act is the core problem, not the solution. Lawyers, union businesses driving a personal agenda, executives driving a personal agenda, career agenda, industry bodies, HR consultants, some union bosses and industry groups work together with conflicts of interest. The IR Club serves vested interests to get money and power. The IR Club is about power with no accountability or little accountability. The IR Club makes workers unproductive and strips entitlements. It is a parasite on workers and employers. The complexity makes it easy for the IR club to rule. The complexity makes it difficult for small business and workers to know their rights. It hurts, suppresses and harms workers. It robs young people of a fair go to buy a home. This is the core industrial relations problem. And Michael Wright, the senior ETU lawyer, and, and uh, Alex Bukarika, again the CFMEU's mining division lawyer, said we need fewer lawyers involved in IR. And employers agree. 
Laws are written to cover the 1 per cent of bad employers and workers. The Fair Work Act is based on what we don't want, not what we want. We need a positive approach instead, based on needs and principles. We need to focus on the 99 per cent good with severe penalties on the bad. Long term, we need to restore the workplace relationship between employers and employees. That is the core relationship. With this new bill, we can, see, we can witness our country being squeezed in the IR club's vice. Whichever way we go, there are, there are hazards. Doing nothing is not an option because it will throw potentially tens of thousands of people out of work. Doing something is difficult, but at least it will give coal miners a pathway to the permanent work. We need to make the best of this bill to, to make sure it protects workers and small business. The first thing, the casuals consider three parts. The pathway to permanent, the conversion. That's welcome. And thanks to our work in the Hunter Valley and the government listening, there is now a pathway to permanency in the, in the coal mining industry because the award didn't have it. Remember the diverse needs, mums and dads, corner stores, small businesses, McDonald's with 110,000 employees, largely casual, mining, retailing, hospitality. Employees and employers today want flexibility and options and, and workers need to apply for the conversion in small business to take the load off small business paperwork. The definition of a casual is now tight. It's strong. We were considering making minor modifications. We've made one modification in the amendments, but it's very difficult here to make sure of future unintended consequences. So what the government has done is it's agreed to our amend amendment that we will have a review in 12 months. Now, the, th the third aspect of casuals is the offsetting section. That's to prevent double dipping. Don't listen to the scare tactics. Double dipping is when someone is paid a casual loading instead of entitlements and then claims entitlements they're paid twice. No Australian would say that's right. No Australian who's fair dinkum would say that. Now, under this offset clause, it makes that clear. But the offset says you still get entitlements. It just means you can't be paid twice. Protections are built into this new, uh, new amendment from the, in the in the bill, we checked. It protects workers' rights. It protects workers' rights. We checked the government's application to the High Court. We checked that the workers' rights remain intact regarding pay rates, and any legal cases underway continue underway. They're not excluded by this. Don't listen to the lies. The second section, compliance. We agree with the stiff penalties for deliberate systemic wage theft. We also acknowledge that we are working and discussing with the government for a moratorium for small business. But that's too complex for this bill, so we're not interested at the moment in pushing that today. Greenfields, the third, site, the third aspect. We want to cut the maximum duration for an EA from eight years, as the government wants, down to six years. And that's based on evidence, project length. We want to protect workers during that six years by making sure that wage adjustments are based on the percentage increase on national, wage, national minimum wage. That's fair. We want to raise the, the uh, lower limit of projects that are considered large from $250 million to $500 million. We want to remove the ministerial discretion to regulate. And in future, we want the government to provide more opportunities for Australian-owned construction companies. And we will be watching to make sure the government doesn't open up to foreign workers, just like Labor did under the Rudd-Gillard shortened years. Fourth section, enterprise agreements. We've, the government has already agreed to our, our uh, d demand to drop the changes to the boot test. Flat, did it early in the early days. Zombie agreements, we want to include three months notice before the expiry of zombie agreements. And we, want to, and we will make sure, we are making sure that employee protections are preserved as they are in this section on enterprise agreements. The awards, the simplified additional hours agreement, which is common in many, in many awards already, helps business recovery. We want to make it more secure for part-time workers, sorry, for part-time permanents. We want to give them more secure work. We want to make sure the conversion, not only uh, after 12 months, for their standard, uh, sta to, to regular hours. If, if they've had a change, a simplified additional hours agreement for 12 months, then incorporate them into standard hours, in regular hours. We want safety to be considered in flexible work arrangements. And we want to review after 12 months, as I said, and the minister to report to parliament. This bill is before us. We need to protect small business and honest workers. Governments and the parasitic industrial relations club leeches need to get the hell out of the way so workers can be protected and productive. We need the productive workers in our society to get a fair go. 
We invite all parties to come together and engage in a bipartisan approach based on principles and workers' needs. Workers have diverse needs, flexibility and options, fair go, protection, security. Employers have diverse needs, flexibility and options. And that will enable them to employ more people because only investors, employers and workers create jobs. We need to restore the core workplace relationship between employers and employees. We need to simplify and clarify the Industrial Relations Act. Hopeless. We need to just do a very good job on this so that it protects and supports workers and gives workers and small business flexibility. A system that exposes and holds poor managers accountable and rewards honest and fair managers and honest and fair workers. One Nation will work with all parties and the government to support workers and small business in the future once this bill is out of the way and we can get on with the real job of fixing this. We will continue to work for our three aims for supporting Simon Turner. And I just mentioned that if we do nothing, thousands, tens Senator of thousands of people Roberts, will be out of work. your time has expired. Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. As my colleague and Australian Greens leader Adam Band has said in the other place, this bill does three things. The first is that it lets employers call you casual even if you're not, and there's nothing you can do about it. The second is that it spells the beginning of the end of full-time work contracts because it introduces into the system a new kind of co contract where the employer can employ you part-time or full-time and then put your hours up and down as the employer wants. Full-time work will be a thing of the past. Guaranteed full-time work will be a thing of the past. And the third thing is that the government doesn't tell you about this is it takes an already difficult process of bargaining for better wages and conditions and it tilts it even further in the employer's favour, making it harder for people to ask in their workplace what they're entitled to. I mean, all three of those steps are terrible steps, but it's so consistent with this Liberal government's approach to their government. They are attacking workers. They are attacking the environment. They are attacking civil society. They are governing for their mates, not for the rest of us. They are doing everything they can to undermine anything that stands in the way of big corporations and corporate profits. And never mind that we have just been through an unprecedented global pandemic, and we are still going through that global pandemic. Never mind that we are in a climate emergency. Never mind what the devastating impacts um, that these attacks are having on the lives of workers. They are still determined to undermine and attack workers at every turn. I mean, let's talk about the pandemic and the year that we have just been through—2020, that year that people want to put in the bin. And it's particularly the case for people who are already on insecure and casual work, because the pandemic has highlighted the inequality that has been allowed to flourish as a result of insecure work in Australia. Casual workers were hit the hardest during the pandemic. They accounted for approximately two-thirds of the people who lost their jobs in early, early last year. And those casuals who still got it had a job, they were amongst the lowest paid and the most insecure workers. They had no access to paid leave entitlements. And we also must not forget the role that insecure work played in spreading COVID-19 across the country, as workers without sick leave were forced to choose between their health or losing their income. And workers who are juggling this mix of multiple part-time jobs, of course they were going to go and fulfil their multiple part-time jobs because they needed to. They needed to do that to put food on the table. And yet they were just the conditions, particularly if some of those, one of those casual part-time jobs was working in hotel quarantine, well then that was just the conditions to be spreading COVID across the country and led to the massive upsweep in COVID cases in early last year. Um, and so many employers, I mean, they have built insecure work into their business models. And while they turn a profit, workers have not had job or in income security. And it's notable that many of the most powerful, 
the richest the, um, individuals and companies in Australia, they did very well out of the pandemic. Their profits increased. At the same time, there was a huge amount of suffering of people doing it really tough during the pandemic. So that was where we were at with our industrial relations systems as it was. And yet what this legislation is going to do is to make it even worse. It's going to make work even more insecure. It's going to mean that people have got less security in their lives and their jobs. It's going to, the, I mean, the changes in this bill will further entrench insecure work in Australia and exacerbate the existing inequality in our industrial rela relations system. And this is at a time, as I said, when profits for those at the big end of town have increased. Where we had you know, the article in the media this morning about a billionaire happy to be interviewed on the front page of the newspaper. So, you know, they wanted to interview him and it said, let's come and take a photo, you know, in front of your indoor pool. And the billionaire said, which indoor pool? I've got three. <laughs> Appalling. Yes. <laughs> that is the reality of the inequality that is in existence in this country. At the same time as you have got billionaires whose wealth has increased during the pandemic, you have people on the most insecure incomes who literally have not got the money to put food on the table, who are literally starving. And that is here in, a country, in Australia, one of the richest countries in the world. That's not the Australia that I want to live in. I want to live in an Australia that I thought we had a social contract that said we were committed towards equality. We were committed towards everybody having the opportunity to have a secure income, to have the opportunity to have a house that they could feel with a secure house and a roof over their head, to have the ability to put food on the table to feed their kids, to give everybody the opportunity to flourish. The elements of this legislation are undermining that equal Australia. So I want to go to some of the details of what's in this bill. I mean, the, casual, the changes to casual labour definitions will be devastating for people across the country. I mean, workers, particularly casual workers, they already face a power imbalance with their employers, and this bill will make it worse. I want to outline some of the things that the ACT, ACTU said in their submission. I mean, they, in, in terms of casual workers and more jobs being casualised, they, they noted that the bill will result in fewer permanent jobs with rights, increase in the casualisation of the workforce. And as I said, the casualisation of the workforce has been um, absolutely um, turbocharged in recent years. This is rather than giving people more secure, more permanent, it will increase the casualisation of the workforce. And the casual conversion provisions of the bill, um, the ACTU said, are essentially meaningless because an employer is not bound to offer a regular casual a permanent job if they don't think it would be reasonable to do so. And the same employer can veto a worker's right to have the Fair Work Commission consider if their decision is fair. Um, the bill allows employers to call a, ca a worker casual even if the job isn't casual. I mean, stripping them of entitlements such as sick leave. And you only have to know, I mean, when, when people get sick, that's when the inequality in our system actually reveals itself. If you're a casual worker and you get sick, well then you can't afford to pay the rent. You can't afford to go out and buy food to put it on the table. You will find yourself homeless. You will find yourself having to be you know, evicted because you haven't got an income coming in. This is you know, the inequality that is already built into our system that we should be doing something about to actually be reducing it, rather than legislation like this that increases that inequality. And the bill, the ACTU pointed out, retrospe retrospectively strips misclassified casuals of their right to leave entitlement. So that even if you were, you know, it was acknowledged that, no, you actually weren't a casual, you are a part-time worker and you should have leave entitlements, you don't get the opportunity to get those leave entitlements. Basically, not that everything is stacked in the interests of the employer. And then we have the fact that part-time work is going to be casualised under this bill. It would cut the rights and the take-home pay of part-time workers and effectively turn part-time workers into casuals, putting enormous pressure on them to accept 
extra hours little, with little notice and no overtime. And you think of the consequences of that, particularly for women, particularly for women who have got kids in childcare, for example. You don't have childcare places that actually say, OK, yeah, you know, you've um, got work today, fine, you know, bring your children in. No, you don't. You have to commit to a number of particular days, particular hours for your childcare, and you've got to pay for them. You, uh, the mismatch between childcare provisions and casualised work is enormous. It means that you know, you've got workers who are basically told you've got to turn up for work, you've got to work an extra few hours, who haven't got childcare. What do they do? It's actually putting a huge clash between people's family responsibilities and their work requirements. And just, you know, if we want to be allowing women in our country to be flourishing, to be able to manage and juggle both um, their family responsibilities and their work responsibilities, we've got to give them the security. We've got to give them the ability to know that here are their hours of work, that they can organise their lives, they can organise their childcare around those hours of work so that both they and their children can flourish. And, and these cuts can be imposed upon any part-time worker under any award by regulation. So these um, provisions, I think it's also worth reflecting upon how that they, who particularly in our society they're going to affect. Who are the people that are most likely to be impacted by the, these provisions? They are migrant workers and they are younger workers. I mean, migrant workers who are already much more likely to be in casu underpaid, casualised workforce, it, part of the under, underpaid, casualised workforce, it, it re reduces their bargaining power immensely. So it's, it's basically a racist provision because we know that it's going to be impacting on people of colour much more than people who have had the privilege of, of being in secure work already. And then it reflects the, the impact on younger people. It was younger people who overwhelmingly lost their jobs during the pandemic. It was younger people who have still got skyrocketing rates of unemployment, who really, even though the economy is you know, kicking back into action now, they look at the prospects for work and they think, where are the jobs? It's younger people who are juggling both studying and, and working as well, who are working with jobs in, in hospitality, for example. Those jobs just aren't there yet. They are the people who are going to be most affected by this. And it's just at a time when, you know, if you are, again, finished up, finished in, finishing your, your studies, you are looking for work it's at the same time as you want to be actually having some security for your future. You want to be looking forward. You've probably, you know, if you've found a partner, you're thinking about having a family. You're thinking about, yeah, it'd be nice to move out of this share household that you're sharing with eight other people into a, into a house where you can settle down. But you can't do that if you haven't got secure work. You can't do that if you don't know whether you're going to be able to pay the rent, let alone a mortgage. And you know, the, the young people that I know, the, the, the friends and colleagues of, of my two children in their 20s, the idea that they think that they'll ever be able to sort of have the security of employment to be able to pay a mortgage, to own a house, they laugh at you. And yet this, as I said, this is in Australia. This is Australia, the, one of the richest countries in the world. We can do better than this. We can give people job security. We can give people a sense of hope about the future. But not if you have legislation like this that is just exacerbating the existing inequalities, and exacerbating that huge divide between those with power in our society and those without. This is just such a backwards... A, backwards bit of legislation. It's so much not in the interests of the future of Australia. Because we know that how we are going to develop as a country, it depends upon having people having that sense of hope for the future. It depends upon people feeling that they are being treated fa fairly. It, and having the basics of being able to have a secure roof over their heads, having the basics of being able to know that they can put food on the table, that's what gives them the ability to then to be able to contribute to the country, to be able to really work together. If you haven't got those basics, if you're just struggling to survive, well then life is just really, really difficult. Let, you know, you, no way that you can get people um, who are just struggling to put food on the table, struggling to not be homeless, to engage in the political process, for example. It's just completely out of the question. 
We can do better than this, and we must do better than this. We, there is hope, given the wealth of this country, if with a commitment to equality, with a commitment to actually working for the interests of all in this country, to actually be stopping this rush towards inequality and to be building a better future for us all, where everybody is valued, where everybody has got the opportunity to flourish. Everybody who wants a job is able to get a job that has secure conditions, that is well paid, that is doing something that's of use for society that they can feel proud about. We can do this in, the, in this country, but not with legislation like this, not with the ideological commitment to just increasing the power of the already rich and wealthy against the interests of those who haven't got the power in our society. So I really urge, particularly all of the crossbench, and it sounds like we're in a position, I hope that this legislation will be defeated in the Senate today. It is what's needed. And then we can go back to the drawing board and start actually building legislation that makes our, our industrial relations system fairer for all Senator Australians. Senator Rice, your time has expired. Senator Ciccone. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And uh, sort of just would pick up um, from Senator Rice about uh, you know restoring fairness and and, uh, and balance, because if we take a bit of a step back and remember when the Fair Work Act came into this place to replace work choices, work choices was twice the size of the previous act that it sought to replace. And um, at the time, um, you even had the uh, H. I. Nichols Society even criticise the then coalition government for providing more regulation, not less, when it came to their plan for industrial relations and their plan for industrial relations system in this country. Um, but Labor's Fair Work Act at the time it um, put in place a new framework, one that we're very proud of, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, a new framework for workplace relations with the principle of recognising um, the government's intention at the time of providing a balanced framework for cooperation and ensuring that there were productive workplaces right, around, right across the country, pr promoting national economic prosperity and ensuring that there was social cohesion. And I think these are sort of very core principles that we should think about when we come into this place debating such changes to the current uh, piece of legislation. The Act also encourages employees and employers uh, to bargain together in good faith and reach agreement. But yet what we see today and the, the changes before the Senate uh, does the opposite, you know, puts workers and employers against each other. We took the view that it was better for the workers and the bosses at each work site around the country to work together, not just in their interest but also in the interests of our national economy. Because at the end of the day, productivity will increase. And that, if you look at all the stats um, since the introduction of the Fair Work Act, productivity actually increased. But under work choices, it went the other way. So my fear is that we'll end up having a situation where productivity will continue to decline, and that is not good for our economy, especially when we're trying to recover uh, out of uh, the current pandemic. Um, as Senator Farrell and others uh, on, on our side uh, have articulated this week, that the ALP is opposed to, uh, to this bill totally and utterly. And over the 12 months, many Australian workers have experienced the most substantial disruption to their working lives in living memory. So let's not forget that it was around this time, just 12 months ago, that the effects of the coronavirus pandemic first began to manifest in our country. Businesses began to close, communities began to lock down, and most pertinently to this discussion, workers began to suffer. In their millions, Australians all over the country faced the prospect of either losing hours at work or losing their jobs entirely. In their millions, Australians were being kept awake at night in fear of what may lay ahead for them and their families. And I'm sure we can all recall with sadness the seemingly endless lines of those who stood in the cold and the wind at their local Centrelink offices, desperate for support from this government just to get through 
just to put food on the table. This is, of course, to say nothing of those who, through this pandemic, have themselves been on the front line of service in our community and its needs. In particular, I think of the shop assistants at supermarkets all across Australia who manage the crowds and stock the shelves as desperate Australians swamp their stores for supplies to get them and their families through the lockdowns. These workers, often young but not always, put themselves and their own health at risk to ensure that our communities had whatever they needed to keep on going. And they did so, at least at the early stages, as their union, the Shop Distributive and Allied Employees Association, battled to make sure that they were provided with the bare minimal of protection by their employers. Things like sanitised masks, gloves and face shields. You would have just thought that many of these companies would have just thought, you know, we've just got to look after our own employees. But no, it had to take the movement, the union movement, to actually highlight these concerns to many of these uh, employers. For many of these workers, it must have seemed that after 2020, things could hardly get any worse. And yet we have a bill before the Senate that wants to strip away paying conditions. This bill, which can only be described as a vindictive attack on the paying conditions of many of these workers, hard-working workers, who are only now getting back to be you know, a sense of normality for themselves and their families. And this is the biggest thank you that this government can say to all those retail workers and all the other essential workers on, that helped ensure that our country kept ticking along over the last 12 months. This bill will simply, Madam Acting Deputy be President, is nothing short of a kick in the guts to working people and their families everywhere across Australia. Not so long ago, this government was reassuring workers that their conditions were safe, that they would be no worse off under the proposed legislation that was to come. What nonsense. And it's encouraging to hear from media reports today that uh, quite a number of the crossbench are reconsidering uh, their position and even considering um, the amendments that have been put to this chamber. And I do implore them for doing so, because at the end of the day, it is the very people, as I've said earlier, the very people who have ensured that we've all been looked after, that we're all able to put food on our table, are the very people that deserve protection. Not us in this place. I mean, we've got enough protections here in this place. We get paid very well. But it's people outside this building, and many people, especially our cleaners in this building, who deserve the most protection, not taking away their pay conditions. Now, instead of listening to workers and their representatives, instead of protecting these workers and safeguarding their economic future, we have the bill before us. And how predictable it is to see from a coalition government. Certainly this party has strong form when it comes to letting its ideological obsessions get ahead of what's morally right and economically sensible. Let us never forget that work choices reforms from the Howard government were detested by the Australian community. Not long after they were legislated, that government found itself out of job and Mr Howard himself without a seat in the other place. Whilst those op opposite may talk of resets or of cords or the Prime Minister being of someone he tries to compare himself as Bob Hawke, but we know the truth behind this bill. It is nothing like that. It does not do anything for Australian workers. We know about the lack of action it will bring about on wage theft. We know about the lack of action it will bring about on dodgy labour hire firms. We know about the lack of action it will bring about to address the inequities and the injustices that many gig economy workers face each and every day. 
Be in no doubt, this bill, if passed, will entrench all the bad things that our economy does not need. It will make jobs less secure, with workers being more vulnerable to casualisation. It will allow employers to pay workers less than the award. In fact, witnesses to the Senate inquiry on the bill commented that it was something of a big business lobby wish list. And it certainly does appear that that is the case. What kind of support is this for an Australian worker recovering from the pandemic? What kind of reward is this for those who have risked their own health on the front line of the pandemic? Instead of turning to these workers and saying, we're here for you, we're here to get you back to prosperity, or thank you for all you've done, we recognise how important you are to our economy and we're going to pay you appropriately and we're going to secure your employment. What have we gotten from those opposite? Silence. That's what we have. Now, allow me to go through some of the major concerns in detail. This bill strips workers of their rights in the workplace specifically in relation to awards. It will facilitate award provisions being cut, with these implications encompassing all awards, not just a few. The introduction of simplified additional hours agreement will allow employers and certain part-time employees to enter into arrangements that will permit the working of hours which are additional to usual scheduled working hours for those employees without the payment of overtime. And I know overtime is very important to many households. It's probably the only thing that really gets them by, especially rising costs of bills, school fees and the like. It is the overtime that makes a difference and keeps people's heads above water. Such a measure undermines the value of awards in the first instance and has the potential to lead to workers being paid an hourly rate far lower than what would otherwise be, that otherwise they'd be entitled to. In relation to casualisation, it will permit workers who may currently be classified as permanent employees have their employee status converted to casual, reducing their standing in the workplace. If there is one thing that the pandemic has shown us, Mr Acting Deputy President, it is those workers in our community who are genuinely essential are highly underpaid, undervalued and subject to significantly higher rates of casualisation. And I bet they're predominantly also female workers as well too. I can't think of any other group other than shop assistants, who I had the pleasure of representing for six years. Now I mentioned shop assistants, and I'll also mention hospitality workers and gig economy workers who have facilitated food and other essential items being delivered out to our doorsteps. These workers have shown their immense value over the last 12 months and it is quite frankly a disgrace that not only can so few of them say they have secure, reliable work, but that this government would be seeking to make the situation even worse for them. This casualisation is not a byproduct or unintended consequence of some law from long ago. It is a deliberate cause of policy decisions consci consciously being made by government and those opposite to make sure that our most vulnerable workers, more beholden to the whims of bosses, and be under no illusion. If this bill is made law, it will serve to make more jobs that ought to be reliable and permanent less so. And that's not where this bill ends. On top of the measures that would see workers' wages reduce and their security at work undermined, this bill will wind back protections workers have fought for for a very long time and they'll continue to suffer under wage theft. Wage theft is a crime. 
It is a criminal act to deny workers what they are rightly entitled to. And I am appalled that it has taken as long as it has to recognise this fact and to legislate it. But it is owing to this government's record on matters that, whilst they have stood around twiddling their thumbs and looking the other way, state governments right around Australia have had to push ahead with progressive legislation on this very issue to protect workers. In my home state of Victoria, the Labor government has put in place robust protections for workers, but this bill would override those measures. It will replace laws at the state level with flimsy laws at a Commonwealth level. It will leave workers worse off. I am disappointed that this is what it has come to. As has been mentioned by others in this place, the government undertook 32 working group meetings with stakeholders over a period of 10 weeks regarding potential industrial relations reforms. Together, these account for around 150 hours of discussion. Many appeared before these working groups in good faith in hope that the government would come to the table in the same manner, but they Thank have you, not. Senator, Ciccone, uh, Senator Waters. Thanks very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. And I rise to speak on the Fair Work Amendment supporting Australia's Jobs and Economic Recovery Bill of 2021, um, which once again is a very poorly titled bill. What it really should be called is the Supporting Our Big Business Political Donomates at the expense of ordinary Australians and workers. But uh, honesty is not a big feature of this government. Um, those same big businesses have already benefited disproportionately from the tax cuts uh, that this government has legislated, which of course are now under debate. And frankly, they already dodge paying their uh, legal tax obligations much of the time. And meanwhile, the rest of the country, ordinary Australians are facing unprecedented uh, health, housing and employment crises. Wages have stagnated for decades and the costs of living keep on rising. We've got 40 per cent of Australians in insecure work. And the thing that is, I find most sobering, one in four people who are working full time live in poverty. The COVID pandemic has made that worse. It's further exposed the impact on individuals and families of insecure work. And we all remember because people were put in the invidious position of having to decide whether to go to work when they had the sniffles because they needed the money to buy dinner or to go and do the right thing and get a COVID test and isolate until they got the result but not be paid during that entire period. Now, that was a very difficult decision for so many workers in this nation. Casual and contract and gig economy workers have always been our most vulnerable workers, and these proposed reforms will make it worse. They will entrench insecure work at a time when people can't even afford the basics like rent and groceries. This bill will allow employers to wrongly classify permanent employees as casuals. Full-time work will become a thing of the past because there's a new low-hours contracts uh, whole category of worker, which guarantees you only 16 hours a week, with everything else after that completely at the whim of your employer. Workers won't be able to plan their lives, they won't be able to plan their work, and that of course puts them at a massive, massive disadvantage when they're seeking to negotiate pay rises. That will lead to even further wage stagnation. Unions will be written out of the bargaining process which suits this government nicely, and it will lock in inflexible agreements for years. An insecure, casualised workforce is also far less likely to unionise in the first place, um, and we all know that there's no better way for a worker to improve their pay and conditions than by joining their union and organising collectively. This government has been trying to attack that for decades, um, and this bill is just the next instalment in that. Now, the controversy over uh, the better off overall test um, shouldn't distract from the core of this bill. The dumping of that boot test um, was a good step, but it doesn't change the fact that this bill, in the main, is still a terrible bill. 
Um, we will fight this bill every step of the way, and I'm very pleased to see that uh, indeed some of the pivotal crossbenchers have come out just an hour or so ago saying that they too will oppose the awful parts of this bill that will entrench casualisation and make insecure work and conditions even worse in this country. Um, so we're all watching um, with great attention to see whether those comments in fact hold, because sadly One Nation, of course, have done a deal with the government, um, as they always do. I don't know why they don't just merge and, and get it over and done with. But we will fight this bill every step of the way, and the audacity of the timing of this bill. Right when JobKeeper is about to be axed, right when the increased rate of JobSeeker is about to be removed entirely, and when this government's come back with an absolutely pitiful increase on that, an insult of what $3.57 a day, um, right when uh, insecure work is at all-time highs, they now they choose now to bring in a bill that will entrench and worsen insecure work. I mean, the audacity of this government just knows no bounds. They've used the pandemic as a cover to bring in all of the nefarious things that they've been wanting to bring in for years, um, and they try to get away with it. And it's up to this chamber, as the last backstop against the nastiness and the greediness of this government, it's up to us to stop that and to stand up for the rights of workers in this country. And I hope that when the vote occurs that that is what the result is today. Certainly the Greens will be blocking this bill. Um, now, we want to raise the minimum wage. Rather than being here trying to protect against further worsenings, we actually want to see um, conditions and pay increased and improved for all workers in this nation. We think the minimum wage should be raised. We think workers' rights and conditions should be bolstered. And we think every, every Australian should have an opportunity for secure employment and meaningful employment to earn what they need to live a good life. We are such a wealthy nation. That should be our first obligation ensure that all of our citizens can live a good life with their basic universal services provided to them and that they have the opportunity, if they wish, for secure and meaningful employment. We think that uh, in, we can in fact protect workers and support small business and create the jobs of the future while investing in research and new industry. You can actually do all of those things at once. They are complementary. Uh, that would, of course, ensure our essential services are, are supported and are truly universal, and that our social safety net is there for all um, who need it, which is sadly far too many. So we will fight this bill with everything that we've got. And it's kind of ironic that the government's attempted to sell this bill as fair and reasonable. It's failed um, because this is the biggest attack on workers' rights since John Howard's work choices. And I'm proud that our party stands with workers and that many of the other um, uh, parties in this place have done the same. And I want to put on record our, our, um, our praise for the efforts of the ACTU to fight these uh, latest attacks on workers' rights. Again, the proof will be in the pudding, but um, it's no surprise that this government is once again trying to take decisions and pass legislation that benefits big business, because big business then uh, make generous donations to their re-election funds. And it's all very lovely for the 1%. Meanwhile, ordinary Australians uh, get worse and worse off as the gap between the haves and the have-nots, wealth inequality, continues to worsen in this nation. Now, over two million Australians are either unemployed or underemployed. That is such a shameful, shameful figure. And we know women, young people and migrant workers are bearing the brunt of that. Now, what are you doing to fix that? Absolutely nothing. Instead of improving job security and lifting people um, out of poverty by lifting wages, you're pushing through a bill that will further entrench insecure work. It will suppress wages um, and it gives more power to businesses at workers' expense and conveniently for you further undermines the power of unions. This bill particularly will hurt women. We know that women suffered the most uh, when COVID hit, and we also know that the government tried to crow about job creation post um, the first wave of COVID, but it's very interesting that um, casual work dominated the post-COVID uh, job increase. 
And, uh, in fact, the figure I've got here is that 62 per cent of all jobs that were created between May and November last year in the, in the post-first wave were casual. So I'm afraid you can't really uh, claim that you're creating jobs, um, uh, trying to claim credit for employing more women when you're employing them on insecure, temporary, tenuous contracts with poor conditions. Um, that this bill is going to lock in and entrench. I mean, the absolute cheek of you. The, the pandemic highlighted that inequality has been flourishing um, as a result of insecure work for decades, and it's very interesting to contrast that with how well billionaires did in the pandemic. Just last year, in 2020, Australia's billionaires increased their wealth by 20%. Well, meanwhile, hundreds of thousands of people um, at the outset of the pandemic lost their job. I'm, I'm pleased that the government ultimately accepted the green suggestion that many others came on board with too, um, to increase uh, job keeper and job seeker for a period, but they're dropping that now, and they're dumping people back into poverty and back into insecure work. They're doubling down. Meanwhile, the billionaires are laughing all the way to the bank. Casual workers were hit hardest during the pandemic, and two-thirds of people who lost their jobs in early 2020 were casual workers. Um, those that still had a job, of course, were amongst the lowest paid, uh, with no access to paid leave entitlements. And the role that insecure work played in spreading COVID cannot be forgotten. Workers without paid sick leave, as I said before, had to choose between um, going and get a test and, and isolating until they had a result, um, but not getting paid or going to work. Now, we, of course, moved for um, paid sick leave to be made available for casual workers, given that we were in an unprecedented global pandemic, but we got absolutely nowhere. In fact, many employers have built insecure work into their business models, and while they turn a profit, workers have had no job security and no income security. This bill will make it worse. Instead of passing a bill that will entrench insecure work, reduce wages and increase the power of employers, we need to outlaw insecure work and ensure that the rights of all workers are protected in law um, and that they have a right for safe, meaningful, secure work with good wages and conditions. Um, now, our leader in, uh, of our party who sits in the House is, of course, an industrial relations lawyer, so I bow to his superior expertise in examining this bill. And he's identified that there are three uh, particularly offensive uh, impacts of this bill. The first is that it lets employers call you casual, even if you're not, and there's absolutely nothing that you can do about it. The second is that it is actually the start of a real threat to full-time working contracts, because it introduces this new form of contract where the employer can in fact employ you part-time, but then put your hours up and down as they so wish. And again, you can't actually do anything about it. It is just unfathomable that this government is trying to ram a, a bill that does such huge things to the employment contract that we understand more broadly um, and, and thinks it's going to get away with it under the cover of a pandemic and a recovery from same. Um, the last thing that this bill does that the government doesn't want you to know about um, is that it takes an already difficult bargaining process um, uh, for wages and conditions and it tilts it even more in the employer's favour, making it harder for workers to ask in their workplace what they're actually entitled to. So um, I've talked already about the pernicious decision that people were forced to make between actually being paid as casuals or, um, or isolating and getting tested during the throes of the pandemic. But we know that casual work has been a challenge for people uh, this whole time pre-pandemic because it makes it impossible to plan your life. It makes it impossible to plan your income flow. Uh, and it's a genuine uh, threat to being able to pay the rent, pay the groceries, um, or manage your childcare responsibilities. So the bill uh, seeks to double down on this, and it essentially says that the definition of a casual employee is that if the employer says you're a casual, well, you are. And that's basically it. Well, again, this is all stacked in favour of employers, and it, will, it just rides roughshod over what little rights casual workers have. They're basically going to have none if this bill passes. Now, the threat to full-time working contracts is an important one to note, um, because if you at the moment work more than 16 hours a week, and you know you respond to a job ad that's for a job for 20 or 30 hours a week, 
you get all your pay and conditions on that basis. But if you uh, work more than that, will you get overtime? Not so under this bill. There's a new form of employment uh, contract that says you can be employed on a minimum of 16 hours a week, but the employer can then lift you up or down according to unilaterally their desires. Um, you can't uh, actually get any additional entitlements. You don't get any pay uh, for working as overtime, even though it technically should be overtime. Before this bill passes, it would be considered overtime. So um, all of a sudden, an employer doesn't have to offer a full-time contract, do they? They just offer a 16-hour-a-week contract, and they have this massive um, uh, they might call it flexibility, but it's actually just deep unfairness to punt people up or down according to their needs with, with no thought to the difficulty that that will have for people that need to pay their rent or pay a mortgage, for example. People won't actually be able to get loans if they can even afford to buy a house um, with prices the way they are because there's no certainty of income there. The banks won't loan to them. Well, the Reserve Bank has actually been saying that we want wages increased to help get the economy moving, but this bill will further decrease wages. People are going to feel less confident about coming forward and asking for a pay rise because the employer holds all the cards. Um, that third aspect I don't have time to go into, but this bill is it's like it's work choices all over again. And I beg the crossbench to stand firm on their suggestions that they will block this bill. And I proudly say that the Greens will strongly oppose this bill. Senator Abetz. Workplace relations policy is a unique coming together of economic and social policy. There needs to be a nuanced approach, which acknowledges the need for viable employers, because without viable employers there are no jobs, and without jobs there are no employees. It is an inherent need for humankind to be gainfully employed. That is why the social data overwhelmingly advises us that a person's mental health, physical health, self-esteem, social interaction are all enhanced if they have the benefit of gainful employment. So at the forefront of our minds as legislators should be the enhancement of job creation growing the jobs pool as much as possible to enable as many of our fellow Australians to gain from those benefits that I've just outlined. And so in setting our policies, it's about job creation. It's about job sustainment, the remuneration of those jobs and pathways for progress without stifling job creation. It is known that in general terms, if you start on the lowest rung of the employment ladder, 80 per cent or so move up a rung or more within the first 12 months, and within two years the vast, vast bulk have moved up that ladder of, of the employment opportunities that are available. And therefore it's important that in setting the parameters for employment, we ensure that the first rung on that employment ladder is not set too low so people live in poverty. We don't want that. But nor do we want that first rung to be set so high that too many of our fellow Australians are denied the opportunity of employment, because to do so denies them all the benefits that I previously outlined. And it's not only for them, the social data tells us also that people in a household of a person gainfully employed also benefit from those four factors that I indicated earlier. We in the Liberal Party believe that the employer-employee relationship is in fact a symbiotic relationship. They rely on each other, and enterprise needs workers just as much as workers need an enterprise in which to work. And that is why we on this side absolutely and categorically reject the assertion that somehow employment law is about this old-fashioned discredited concept of class warfare. Instead of seeking 
to set worker against employer and employer against worker, we seek to ensure that there is as good a relationship as possible where workers and employers can cooperate to the very best of their ability to ensure that the enterprise remains viable. Now, look, we know what human nature is like. There will be those employers that will seek to rip off the workforce. That is why we have a Fair Work Ombudsman. That is why we have the Fair Work Commission. That is why we have authorities in place to protect workers' fundamental rights. That is why, as part of this bill, something which I argued before it was in fact adopted by the coalition, the concept of wage theft being seen as a criminal offence. Guess who is introducing that in, or seeking to introduce that into Australian law for the very first time? It is a Liberal National Party government. When the Australian Labor Party had the levers of government in their hands and introduced the celebrated Fair Work Act, did they introduce the concept of wage theft and criminality? No, they did not. It was not on their radar. It is on our radar. That is why we are seeking to introduce such a concept in this bill. And what do the so-called champions of the worker do in this place? They're telling us they're going to vote against it. They are going to vote against the criminalisation of deliberate wage theft. These are the people that allegedly are on the side of workers. I would have thought they would have had the decency to say this was a huge omission in the Fair Work Act originally. It should have been there, and we congratulate the government, the Liberal National Party government, on its introduction. But the relentless negativity of the Labor Party is such that no matter what the government does, they will be against it or put a negative spin on it. And so we on this side, we reject the class warfare notion that seems to permeate everything that the Australian Labor Party and especially the Greens talk about in this place. We see the need for there to be constraints to ensure that employers don't rip off their workers. Similarly, we seek to ensure the trade unions cannot rip off their members. That's interesting, isn't it? The Labor Party are against both measures. They don't support the criminalisation in this bill of wage theft, nor do they support the criminalisation of having unions brought to account if they steal or misappropriate uh, misappropriate their members' funds. One really wonders what motivates the Australian Labor Party in this space. And so the stifling negative hand of class warfare is something which we on this side repudiate. Indeed, from the very beginning of the foundation of the party that I have the honour of representing, we said in its foundational document that Sir Robert Menzies penned, we believe that improved living standards depend upon high productivity and efficient service, and that these vital elements can be achieved only by free and competitive enterprise. We believe that national financial and economic power and policy are to be designed to create a climate in which people may be in be enabled to work out their own solution in their own way and not to control other people's lives. These are words that have withstood the test of time. These are principles that are very apt for this particular discussion. And this is what we, as a government, are seeking to implement uh, in this legislation. And so some of the contributions that I've had the misfortune of having to listen to in this debate, tells me about a government wanting to cut wages. 
Now, if that were genuinely true, do you think the workers of Australia would have voted to re-elect us at the last election? Let's be exceptionally clear here. There are an overwhelming number of workers in comparison to the few people that run the big businesses in this town, uh, in this country. And so this nonsense that somehow all we do is the bidding of big business makes one wonder why on earth the vast bulk of workers in fact do vote for the Liberal National Party's uh, come election time. They see through the nonsense. They see through the rhetoric of the Australian Labor Party and they know that the security of their job is determined by the security of the business, the enterprise in which they work. The previous uh, speaker told us that workers' wages should be raised. Of course, we all agree with that, but you've got to have the overlay of, is it affordable? And in tough times, wages will not be increased as one would like them to be increased. You can increase them if you like, but the Fair Work Commission itself has acknowledged that in some areas the pay rates are such that it mitigates against job creation and job sustainment. And so you can have one person on a very high wage, if you like, or two people on a decent wage. I would go for two people on a decent wage as being the better economic and, most importantly, social outcome. And indeed, that's why we have the Fair Work Commission in this country that actually sets the rate of pay or approves the rate of pay. We have an independent umpire making these determinations. So the assertion that somehow the government is trying to legislate lower wages suggests that the Fair Work Commission is not doing its job. The Labor Party, by implication, are saying that the Fair Work Commission, which they appointed, is an organisation in which they have no confidence. We all know that the higher the cost of a product, the less likely it is to be bought. Same with services. And so if you artificially inflate wages that's not sustainable by the business, jobs will be shed and lost. And the best way to run the economy and if you want a good example in recent times, was the Howard government. Low inflation with real wages having increased by 19 per cent. And just as we left government, the unemployment rate finally had a three in front of it. That is good economic management, where real wages can increase in a good, healthy, sound economy. In the few moments remaining, let's turn to the specific matters in this bill. I've already dealt with the issue of wage theft, something which I have supported for a long time and I'm delighted that it's now before the parliament. Shattered, might I say, that the Labor Party and the Greens cannot even bring themselves to vote for that particular um, uh, part of the legislation. But this bill will provide certainty to businesses and employees by clearly defining what it means to be a casual employee and give, giving eligible casual employees a statutory pathway to permanent full-time or part-time jobs if they wish. Why would Labor and the Greens be opposed to such a sensible, clarifying provision in this legislation? Indeed, Labor in their Fair Work Act had no such definition. We are bringing clarity and certainty, both for worker and the employer, but no, Labor likes to have this not so well clarified because it then provides greater grounds and opportunities for disputes. We want clarity, we want certainty. That's what the Australian worker wants. That's what Australian businesses want as well. We want to extend our successful JobKeeper flexibilities around duties and location of work to businesses in retail and hospitality so that those 
two hard-hit uh, sectors can continue to work together to navigate the pandemic. Surely that is something that should be embraced and accepted. And indeed, uh, I think at one stage uh, the Labor leader actually supported that and, of course, as is his want, has uh, now recanted. And the, in fact, it's in relation to Greenfield's agreements where he's recanted his position. Why, when this is the opportunity for new jobs, global investment coming into Australia, providing certainty? But no, we want to close the door on that and thus deny our fellow Australians the opportunity of more jobs. We know the social consequences of such a denial. Why would Labor and the Greens therefore oppose our measures to ensure the Greenfields agreements will be more certain and, as a result, allow more international capital into Australia, create investment which in turn creates jobs. And as part of our measures, we will include a free advisory service for small business to ensure that employees can recover their correct entitlements faster. We have all sorts of provisions in this which are fair, which are equitable, which are reasonable, but which do not fit the century-old mantra of worker class warfare which the Labor Party, unable to bring itself into the 21st century, still wallow in. I support the bill and commend the bill to the Senate, especially the crossbench. Senator Forsyth. Acting Deputy President, I thought Senator Griff was next on uh, your list, but I'm very happy to uh, stand to address this bill. Particularly, I'd like to address uh, some of the comments that have been made about uh, the coalition being on the side of big business and, and not on workers. Uh, certainly, the coalition, yeah, as per the Liberal Party's statement of belief, do believe in small government on letting people get on with the job in the private sector of creating wealth and creating jobs, which is what they do. Uh, the only sustainable way for a country to move ahead is for the private sector to be able to create jobs. But we recognise, as coalition uh, speakers have mentioned in various contributions to this debate, that there does need to be a framework that ensures fair outcomes for workers as well as opportunities and business conditions that encourage employers and investors to invest in creating businesses, in creating the opportunities to employ and giving them the certainty around the conditions uh, that they operate under so that they will employ, and particularly as we come out of this COVID environment. But I do wish to come to the content of this bill in the context of a number of news reports to highlight sometimes things don't go well. If you look through news reports uh, over the last year or so, there have been a number of companies that have been accused of underpaying staff by various amounts. Some names are very familiar, grilled. Some institutions are very trusted, the ABC, Qantas, Super Retail Group, Commonwealth Bank, Michael Hill, Sunglass Hut, Bunnings, the Rockpool Dining Group, Woolworths, 7-Eleven, Subway. There's a whole range of companies as well as entities uh, that are essentially part of government that have been found guilty of underpaying workers. Now, this legislation goes directly to that issue, particularly in Schedule 5. It looks to strengthen the compliance and enforcement framework in the Fair Work Act to protect workers from wage underpayments while supporting businesses to comply with their obligations, including through the introduction of a free advisory service for small business and to ensure that employees can recover their correct entitlements more quickly. So I'm going to go into some more detail of that in a minute, but I just want to highlight that we recognise there are times where the government does need to put in place a framework Concerns around the conduct of everyone from the ABC and Qantas through to small business have been raised in the media, have been raised by members opposite. 
This bill addresses it. And I'm somewhat perplexed by the fact that those opposite and on the crossbench are choosing not to support these measures which directly address some of the key concerns that have been raised in our community in recent years. More broadly, the bill also goes on to provide certainty to businesses and employees by clearly defining what it means to be a casual employee and giving eligible casual employees a statutory pathway, giving them certainty to permanent full-time or part-time jobs if they wish. It extends the JobKeeper flexibilities around the duties and locations of work to business in the retail hospitality sector so that those businesses that have been doing it hard and their employees can continue to work together to find the best combination of conditions that will ensure the business survives and so those people continue to have a job. It gives employers greater confidence to offer secure part-time employment to employees and facilitate additional hours of work for part-time employees in retail and hospitality, people who often want more hours but aren't getting them at the moment. And we've heard comments again from people in the media and those opposite about underemployment, and yet here is legislation that seeks to directly address the barriers that prevent employees, employers having the confidence to provide those extra hours, and yet it's not being supported. The bill also streamlines and improves enterprise agreement making, which will drive wage growth and increase productivity as a result of the increase in agreements. It also encourages investment in large projects uh, by allowing for greenfields agreements, which gives certainty to both parties, employees, investors uh, and the employees, as to what those conditions will be for up to eight years. And lastly, as I started with, it addresses the enforcement framework. And that's where I'd like to go, because the narrative which has been run by many in this chamber during the debate is that the government is on the side of big business and we're pushing these reforms through at the request of big business and we're just trying to support big business. That theme has come through repetitively again and again. So if we have a look at the compliance and enforcement section, and particularly if you go through the Bill's Digest, which very helpfully picks out some of the key measures but also looks at the stakeholder engagement and says, what were the views of the various stakeholders who were consulted on this? And it's largely broken down into academia, to the union movement, uh, and to employer groups. What you find is that there's actually a remarkable deal of support from unions for measures, for example, in this wage theft area, which are actually opposed by industry groups. So in black and white, in the Bill's Digest, so that's not a product of the government or the coalition, that's a function of the independent parliamentary process. The Bill's Digest highlights very clearly that this legislation is actually seeking to put in the appropriate framework that protects workers, that guarantees their entitlements and makes sure that employers, whether they're the ABC or Qantas or down to a small business who do the wrong thing, do face appropriate penalties and that workers do get their entitlements. And the fact that it is supported in some particular clauses, which I'll go to, there's some reservations about wording or particular um, who penalties are paid to, for example, uh, by the unions, but it's supported in broad by the unions and opposed by business it highlights that the opposition is playing politics with this as opposed to seeking real outcomes for workers. Because here is a case demonstrated in the digest where the government is not lining up with big business. We're actually saying those who behave poorly should be held to account. Those who behave poorly should pay a penalty and workers should get their entitlements. And the amendments proposed in this legislation are opposed by business and supported by unions in general. And so that highlights that what's occurring here is political in nature. So in the broad, under this bill, we'll better protect employees from wage theft. 
will deter dishonest employers from undercutting their competitors by introducing tougher penalties and will facilitate a more efficient recovery of wage underpayments and encourages businesses to identify and address underpayments more quickly. So the better and stronger protections for employees will include tougher penalties and orders to deter non-compliance. These measures include a new criminal code offence for dishonest and systemic underpayments of one or more employees with a maximum penalty of four years imprisonment. Four years imprisonment. An automatic directed disqualification for five years and or a fine of over a million dollars or over five million dollars for a body corporate. Those are significant penalties. It's not surprising in some ways they are opposed by industry, but what it demonstrates is that this government is serious about saying whilst our philosophical position is that we should remove barriers and encourage business to take risks and invest and work to create wealth and jobs, when they get it wrong and it's systemic and intentional, then they should face penalties. And yet the Labor Party is opposing this measure. The bill also increases maximum civil penalties for underpayments, sham contracting, failing to comply with regulator compliance notices and increasing penalties available under infringement notices. It prohibits employers from advertising jobs with pay rates below relevant national minimum wage and it clarifies that courts can make adverse publicity orders where appropriate. Uh, it goes on to expand and improve the small claims wage recovery process by increasing the small claims cap from $20,000 to $50,000, which allows courts to refer appropriate claims to the Fair Work Commission for faster resolution through conciliation or consent arbitration. It will encourage businesses to proactively identify and self-disclose where there have been underpayments, to rectify those more quickly and efficiently, which ensures that existing employees are recompensed, but also that going forward employees get what they uh, are entitled to under their conditions. And it codifies factors uh, that can be taken into account when deciding whether to accept an enforceable undertaking for wage underpayments, which will provide greater certainty for employers and employees. Now, Mr Burke in the other place said uh, on ABC Radio in December 2020 that vulnerable workers getting their money back quickly has to be the highest priority. And that is one of the key outcomes of Schedule 5 in this legislation, and yet it's being opposed by the Labor Party and the Greens. And as I'll go through now with some sections from the Bill's Digest, the highlighted the consultation that occurred and the submissions and statements that were made publicly by unions and employer groups, what it highlights is that the rhetoric which is being put by those opposite that they're opposing this because the government's on the side of business and not workers does not stack up with the evidence. So Schedule 5, which deals with compliance and enforcement measures in the Bill's Digest, goes through as per normal outlining the broad areas. It outlines proposed amendments, which I've run through, being the remuneration of employees, sham contracting, non-compliance, uh, introducing a new penalty for remuneration-related conventions, contraventions by bodies corporate, and a new civil contravention that prohibits employers publishing uh, job advertisements with pay rates specified at less than the relevant national minimum wage. And what I'd like to go to uh, particularly is looking at some of the consultation in stakeholders' views. So the Bill's Digest highlights that trade unions were generally supportive of the increased penalties. They did express some concern about subsection 546 brackets 3A, which goes to who penalties can be paid to, but they were generally supportive, whereas employer and industry groups generally opposed the changes. Uh, for example, the Australian Industry Group said it's currently drafted many of the provisions in the bill are highly punitive, and they put forward it would operate as a barrier to jobs growth." End quote. As I said, our philosophical position 
is to be small government, encourage the private sector, because they're the ones who generate wealth, they're the ones who generate the opportunity for people to work, and generally speaking, the vast majority do the right thing. But here in black and white is the evidence that the unions support the measure, with a couple of reservations, whereas industry have said they oppose it, and yet the government is putting forward this measure. We're putting forward this measure in the interests of ensuring that that small group of people who do things inappropriately, the disadvantaged workers, are held to account and the workers get their money back. Which means that the opposition from those opposite to this bill is politically motivated, not in the interests of workers. The same thing can be said about other areas such as increasing the penalties for sham contracting. So again, the bill's digest is very clear. The trade unions support the increase to the penalties applicable for sham contracting. Again, they had some suggestions around particular wording about not reckless as opposed to being reasonable as test, but they generally supported it. But the Australian Industry Group opposed these amendments, saying at this time it's not justified. So yet another example in black and white that these measures, while they're consistent with our overall philosophy of small government encouraging the private sector to create wealth and create jobs, for those who are doing the wrong thing, we will put in place a framework that holds employers to account, whether they be the ABC, Qantas or a small business, and we will look out for the worker. And so for those who are looking to oppose this bill, can I encourage you not to play politics with the recovery of Australia's economy, with secure jobs for Australians and for pay, and to support this legislation, which is in the interests of Australia and its workers? Senator Groove. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy uh, President. This is a complex bill. It is an important bill to many people for many different reasons. Unions see it as an assault on workers. Employers are looking to protect themselves from a potential back pay liability first and foremost. And some want to seize an opportunity to push for significant changes to employee conditions and what they call reform of the Fair Work Commission's procedures. It is not so much a compromise bill as a mess of a bill. The principal reason for this bill was the court cases that potentially brought about a back pay liability for employers. That sent a shudder up every small business person in particular. Along the way, government decided to add in components that simply wouldn't cut it for many employees and the unions that they represent. The boot test is a very good example of a component that ultimately was in fact dropped. So here we are today debating an omnibus bill that deals with a raft of issues, not just the principal reason. This is not acceptable to me nor to many others in this place. So what is Centre Alliance doing? Well, we're pairing back our support to the most important elements of this bill with appropriate amendments. And of course, this includes supporting enhanced protections against wage theft. We are dealing with the matters that matter the most, starting with Schedule 1, which will give employers and particularly small business vital certainty about casual employment, and Schedule 5, which will enact civil and criminal penalties against wage underpayment. The bill will also retrospectively prevent the so-called double-dipping of entitlements. While this will draw a line under the massive outstanding liability, we will move an amendment to ensure that any casual employee who currently has a claim for unpaid entitlements before the courts can still finalise their case under existing laws. This respects the basic principle that people be able to operate under the laws that existed at the time they took action. A right to casual conversion also forms part of this bill, but the current drafting means almost all power lies with the employer. Now, this isn't necessarily a problem as employers do need to be able to decide who they hire and in what capacity. We also don't expect that many employees will seek to convert from casual to permanent, would elect to challenge their employer on this. However, 
We do consider it is important that employees have some means of pursuing an application if they feel they have been hard done by. The government's proposed using the small claims courts and conciliation process outlined in Schedule 5, which we think is a good option should employees wish to pursue it. We will not support the remainder of the bill. It goes well beyond what is needed. It is at times heavy-handed in the way it attempts to address problems in the Fair Work Commission. In other instances, it seeks to legislate matters that are already being dealt with in the courts. By supporting just Schedules 1 and 5, we will address the most important issues, the most urgent issues that need dealing with right now. To provide certainty for employees and particularly small business. And incredibly, I, I'm, I'm somewhat gobsmacked um, that I have just received, and everyone in this chamber has just received the government amendments, and these show they are dropping Schedule 5, dropping the very same schedule that relates to wage theft, dropping it despite almost every speaker including the speaker who was just before me, Senator Fawcett, speaking very positively about this. How can they do this? Shame on you all for trashing such an important amendment. Senator Rennick. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, it is great to be here today because I'm pumped. I'm usually pumped up at the best of times, but I feel like I'm a hot air below, uh, balloon floating along the skies. And I'll tell you why that is. It's because all work is 100 per cent insecure if businesses do not survive. All work is insecure if businesses do not survive. And it'll be the taxpayer who picks up the cost of redundancy or the employee, uh, empl unemployment benefits. And we'll never forget this. It is the employer. It is the employer that pays the employee. It is not the unions. Without the employer, there is no employee. Do unions pay the employee? Does the Labor Party pay the employee? No, Mr. President, they do not. Not only do they not pay the employee, they take from the employee. They take union fees. They take superannuation fees. And most importantly, they take jobs. There is no greater threat to the prosperity of this nation and jobs for working Australians than the Labor Party and the, Labor mu and the union movement. Union bred, union fed, union led. With their bullying, uh, with their complexities and with their gouging, unions steal the jobs of Australian workers and the livelihoods of working families. And now, unbelievably, they've come out and they've said that they want to steal casual workers' loading. Sally McManus of the ACTU has told ABC insiders that casual workers would lose their casual loading in return for portable sick leave, annual leave and long service leave. And, of course, who would manage this? Some union would, of course, no doubt clip the ticket on the money being held on behalf of the worker. And why are unions and Labor always stealing money from the workers? Let the workers manage their own hard-earned income, for Pete's sakes. Get your grubby hands off their money. It's not rocket science. Casual workers get 25 per cent loading. A permanent employee gets four weeks annual leave, two weeks of public holidays and two weeks of sick leave. Which more, than often, which more often than not they don't take and, in many cases, doesn't accumulate. So let's do the sums here. Six weeks over 52 weeks is 11.5 per cent loading. Eight weeks over 52 weeks is 15.4 per cent loading. And if you want to add in another uh, week for annual leave, uh, long service leave loading, make it nine weeks a year, then it's 17.3 per cent loading. That is a long, long way short of the 25 per cent loading that casuals get. Now, the Morrison government isn't going to allow Australian workers to be exploited by the Labor Party and their union mates. 
Under this bill that is before the parliament, we will better protect employee entitlements and deter unscrupulous employers from undercutting their competitors by introducing tougher penalties, facilitating a more efficient recovery of wage underpayments and encourage businesses to identify and address underpayments more quickly. We will introduce stronger protections for employees through measures including tougher penalties and orders to deter non-compliance. Now, Senator Griff has just said apparently Schedule 5 has been pulled out of the bill. It's news to me. Um, I'm happy to take advice to the contrary here, but I'm going to assume that until I've been told otherwise, I'm going to talk about it. Um, so, a new criminal offence for dishonest and systemic underpayments of one or more employees with a maximum penalty of four years' imprisonment, uh, automatic director disqualification for five years and or a $1.1 million fine uh, for employers. Okay, we're going to increase, this bill will increase maximum civil penalties for underpayments, sham contracting, failing to comply with regulator compliance notice and increased penalties under infringement notices. There's also going to be a new prohibition to stop employers from advertising jobs with pay rates below the national minimum wage and clarifying that the courts can make adverse publicity orders where appropriate. This bill will also expand and improve the current small claims wage recovery process by increasing the small claims cap from $20,000 to $50,000 and allow courts to refer appropriate claims to Fair Work Commission for expedited resolution through conciliation or consent arbitration. Now you have to ask yourself why Anthony Albanese and the unions are opposing criminal penalties for wage theft. Is it to protect their mates at Morris Blackburn, who got busted for underpaying staff? Let's not forget this IR firm has strong ties with the Labor Party, especially in Queensland. Senator Murray Watt, Senator Nita Green, the member for Griffith, Terry Butler, they're all ex-employees of Morris Blackburn. Is that what Labor are doing here? Are they running a protection rack racket for their rich lawyer mates? I mean, we know they run a protection racket for their rich union mates and their rich white-collar fund managers in the inner city ivory ca castles, and now they've been busted looking after their rich lawyer mates. I mean, with 122 wards with over 60 pay points in some of these awards, the IR system is nothing but rivers of gold for the unions, the Labor Party and their IR lawyer mates. What we like to call the limousine left. The limousine left. So you see, this bill protects the workers. This bill protects the workers. Now you've got to ask yourself why Labor and the unions are running around fear-mongering about this bill. I'll tell you why, because Labor and the unions have no idea about running a business and creating jobs. You do, Senator Stirl, I'll make an exception for you. And you too, Senator Gallagher. You two guys are good old blue-collar blue Labor guys, right? Um, their only goal is to keep their jobs and to hell with anyone else. And the only way they know how to do that is to use fear as a means to distract people from the truth. And the truth is that only the coalition knows how to protect workers and small business. As we've shown throughout the pandemic, the federal Liberal national government is determined to implement measures that will regrow jobs, boost wages, enhance productivity and benefit both the employer and the employee. Now let's address another aspect of this fear-mongering from the charlatans on the other side of the chamber, that the rate of casualisation has increased. This is not the case in the 21st century. Yes, it did increase once a time, Acting Deputy President. And that was when, yep, let me tell you when that was. That was in the late 80s and early 90s. That was in the late 80s and early 90s. And you know what that was a result of? The Income and Prices Accord introduced by the Hawke Keating government. I can remember it. I was a teenager and Hawke came out over an overnight meeting how uh, they, they had a discussion about this and everyone was praising Bob Hawke. So, you know, if you guys want to talk about the increasing rate of casualisation, I suggest you look at your history and see where it started to take off, because it was a direct result of the Hawke-Keating industrial relations reforms that were widely praised at the time by the unions and by industry as being good measures to deal with the uh, inflation and stagflation at the time. But you don't have to take my word of it. 
You can look at the uh, ABC fact check, and it agreed with former comments by the former Minister for Small Business and Family Minister, uh, Minister Craig Laundie, who said the rate of casuals in the Australian workforce has been steady at 25 per cent for the last 20 years. So for a very long time, the rate of casualisation in this country has not changed. So the fear-mongering on the other side of the chamber needs to stop. Needs to stop. Because I can tell you, no one protects small and family business and no one protects the workers like the Morrison Coalition government. Australia's 3.5 million small businesses are the lifeblood of the Australian economy. They employ over 6 million Australians and contribute approximately $418 billion to our national economy. And when small and family business grow in Australia, the whole economy thrives and every Australian benefits. To keep Australians in work, the Liberal National Government has provided over $260 billion in combined health and economic support to protect Australians from COVID-19 and to put the uh, economy on the road to recovery. And this, bill, this bill is an important part of that. This bill is a very important part to get the economy back on the road to recovery so we can repay the debt as quickly as possible and not leave our children with a burden that they didn't actually incur. So our, our billions of dollars in direct economic support has provided a crucial lifeline to help small business around the country, to help retain their staff and apprenticeships, uh, apprentices, maintain their cash flow and reinvest in their businesses. And we are cushioning the impact of this virus and helping build a bridge of, to recovery so that small business can look forward to a brighter future and get to doing what they do best, creating jobs and supporting their communities. So the changes made by this bill are essential to ensure that our economic recovery continues. This bill will provide certainty to businesses and employees by clearly defining what it is to, uh, the definition of casual employee and giving el eligible casual employees a statutory pathway to permanent full-time or part-time jobs, and this is the key bit, if they wish. Okay? This bill will extend our successful JobKeeper flexibilities around duties and location of work to businesses in retail and hospitality so that hard-hit employers and employees can continue to work together to navigate the pandemic. To navigate the pandemic. And it will give employers greater confidence greater confidence. And there, there's that word again. I mentioned it yesterday afternoon, confidence, optimism. That's what drives, that's what drives prosperity, confidence and optimism, okay? to offer those people who work in uh, secure part-time employment uh, and facilitate additional hours of work for part-time employees and retail and hospitality who want more hours but aren't getting them at the moment. Okay. This bill will streamline and improve enterprise agreement making, which will drive wage growth and increase productivity as a result of the increase in these agreements. It will also encourage investment in job creating mega projects, mega projects, great word that one, by providing, providing greater certainty for employers and employees by allowing the construction of major projects to be covered by a Greenfields Agreement for a maximum of up to eight years. And that's going to help a lot in infrastructure projects that we want to push, and we just need the state Labor governments to come on board because the only uh, state government that, uh, two state governments that are really driving infrastructure in this country are Tasmania and, of course, New South Wales. You know, we were just discussing it this morning in another meeting how Queensland tourism has fallen by the wayside over the last 30 years since the state Labor governments come into power. They've destroyed tourism in Queensland, just like they're trying to destroy mining, destroy agriculture, destroy forestry and destroy fishing. Shocking. Shocking. Just shocking. And we should never forget, when we talk about retail and hospitality, what party it was that increased penalty rates for retail workers. I'll tell you which party that was. That was the coalition government. The coalition government that increased penalty rates from 130 per cent to 150 per cent for weekdays between 6 o'clock and 9 o'clock at night and 140 per cent to 150 per cent for Saturdays. Six days of the week we increase penalty rates because we know that there's times when people need to be rewarded for going that extra mile. For going that extra mile. 
I want to talk about a little bit more of the detail here. This bill will give greater certainty, give employers greater certainty about their obligations, meaning more confidence to hire, more confidence to invest, and casual rights will get stronger rights to convert to permanent employment if they wish. If they wish. But I'll tell you what we're not going to do. I'll tell you what we're not going to do. We're not going to take away the casual uh, workers' loading. That's what the ACT wants to do. They want to take away their loading, 25 per cent loading, and then put about 15 per cent, so they're going to lose 10 per cent in loading, take their 15 per cent that's left and put it into a fund so it can be portable. Well, I'll tell you the best place to put their loading. I'll tell you the best place to put their loading. It's in their pockets because they've worked hard for it. If they wanted annual leave, if they wanted the uh, other uh, features, they would take it. But the reason why they don't is that because a lot of young people just don't get sick. They'd rather take the 25 per cent up front and get a roof over their head as quickly as possible, or it might be that they're working part time while they're studying. And I know myself when I was a student, throughout uh, Christmas holidays I'd take on a bit of extra work, otherwise, and then when I went back to uni, I'd cut back and I'd just work in the pub at night time. So this is what this bill is all about. It is about increasing flexibility, it is about increasing employment. It is about increasing wages and it is about improving the livelihoods of Australian working families. Of Australian working families. It is not about fear mongering, it is not about protecting the rivers of gold for the union movement and the Labor Party. It is about strengthening Australian families. And if we are ever going to move ahead in this country, it is about time the Labor Party got on board. Back in the 80s, we got on board with the Hawke Keating government. So it's about time the Labor Party co uh, cooperated with the coalition uh, party in order to improve the lives of working Australians. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, and just in a, a the few minutes uh, left uh, before the hard marker, I'd just like to make a couple of points. We've spent uh, almost all week on uh, this bill, and we're in the position now, pushing up against a hard marker, where um, the government has lost control of the program. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen next. We're hearing rumours of guillotines and um, hours motions happening. Um, we understand that uh, perhaps the government is, is going to have to significantly amend uh, this bill in order to get um, the remnants of, of, of the bill through the chamber today. Um, and the point I would make, because I'm not sure we're going to be given the time if the guillotine comes in, is that the government needs to be very clear about what they are going to be asking the Senate to vote on today in relation to this bill. Um, if the government have, has amendments that significantly wipe out schedules of this bill, then they need to be moving early to put those before the chamber so that in a constrained debate, which I understand is what we're about to have, that senators in this place understand exactly what it is that they are being asked to vote on. If the majority of schedules are going to disappear from this bill, then the government should be letting the Senate know that is what's happening early, because there are a whole series of amendments that senators have seeking to amend certain schedules. There's no point moving those amendments if the government has given up on those schedules. Uh, we have no idea what the bill that we're going to be asked to vote on looks like once the government has finished their negotiations with the crossbench. We have absolutely no idea. So I say to the government, please be clear early, in, in the once the guillotine's moved, exactly what is left in this bill for senators to vote on. It is unreasonable and it shows the lack of ability you have to manage the business of this chamber that we are in the position where we are going to have a guillotine, an hours motion and significant amendments put to one of the government's flagship bills. We've been debating this for three days. The government's put on a filibuster this morning to keep the bill going because they still don't know what they're doing, and yet we're going to be given a matter of minutes to vote yes or no on legislation that significantly affects working people's lives, perhaps without any idea of how those amendments work together. So to the government, please move your amendments. If you are gutting your own bill, move those amendments early so that the other amendments that crossbenchers 
and others, including ourselves, might have, which might become irrelevant if those schedules disappear, uh, can be dealt with in an appropriate manner. It is going to be a constrained debate. The least the government can do in this mess that has been created over the past three days is to be upfront about what the bill as amended is going to look like and what senators are being asked to vote on. It is a complete schmozzle, frankly, that we have had hours on this bill. All week the government has been scrambling to get this through. It looks like there will be significant amendments, and we would say to them, please let us know what they are and let us know early in the debate. Order. It being 11.45, we will are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Senator Fieravanti Wells. Thank you, Mr. President. Pursuant to notice given yesterday on behalf of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation, I withdraw business of the Senate notices of motion numbers one and two, standing in my name for the next day of sitting, proposing the disallowance of the ASIC Credit Electronic Precontractual Disclosure Instrument 2020-835 and ASIC Credit notice requirements for unlicensed carried over instrument lenders instrument 2020-834. Thank you. Are there any other notices of motion? If not, I'll call on the selection of bills committee. Senator Smith. Thank you very much, Mr President. I present the fourth report of 2021 of the selection of bills committee and I seek leave to have the report incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Smith. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I move that the report be adopted. Question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Rustin. Um, look, thank you, Mr. President. Before we move to, to vote on the selection of, uh, of bills committee. Oh, sorry, I, I have actually just put that. You want to seek? Oh, sorry. Sorry. I right, will. I will. Um, with the leave of the chamber, I'll go back one step and re-put the vote. Senator Rustin, I wasn't aware, was seeking the call to speak on the matter. Senator Rustin, to speak on the motion to adopt the selection of bills committee report. Look, um, thank you, Mr. President, um, and, and I thank the chamber for their indulgence in allowing me to, to speak to this today. Um, what I particularly wanted to do was to just acknowledge the importance of a couple of the bills that we are referring today, um, and, Mr. President, and to, but to thank thank. Thank the, thank the chamber for their Order. indulgence in allowing me to do this today, uh, and also, um, you know, that, that you know, this is a particularly Senator important uh, component of, uh, complete, particularly important component of uh, of the agenda, uh, and just wanted to uh, to acknowledge that there are a number of bills on. Uh, that are being referred today that are, are particularly important going forward. Uh, and uh, as I said, to, to thank the, the indulgence of the chamber um, for, for being able to, to be able to do this. So, um, the, um, <laughs> so um, there are a number of, uh, of bills that, um, that, that we've chosen not to refer uh, <laughs> on the. Order. Okay. Uh, but unfortunately, I wasn't able to be at the meeting, um, Senator Urquhart, last night. Um, you know, which I would have liked, particularly, to have been there last night to actually have the conversation to discuss uh, some of these bills. But, but particularly, the importance Order. of being able to have the process by which we refer um, these bills um, to Senator committee. Gallagher. Because in this place, often we come in here and we have conversations around Order, the fact that, um, that the committee process in Order. The I've got Senator Patrick on a point of order. Senator Patrick. Uh, Mr President, I don't think that qualifies properly as a filibuster. Uh, we need better Senator from Patrick, the... that's, what is your point of order? Or do you not just, have a point of order? <laughs> just that she's not filibustering Senator, properly. Senator Patrick, that is not a point of order. <laughs> Senator Rustin, to continue in silence, please. Yeah, thank you. Actually, um, and I, I will take the interjection or the, the attempt to, uh, to, 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 uh, to pull me up on the, the manner in which I'm addressing this particular uh, section from uh, from but yeah, no, you can if you like um, uh, from Senator Patrick because I know Senator Patrick takes the the reference uh, and the referral of bills to committees very seriously because I know that he understands uh, that the committee process is what makes this chamber operate the way that it does, Mr. President, because Order. it is a very very important component of it uh, and and probably would uh, you know point out 
to, to the chamber that you know everybody in this place should take our committee processes very very seriously uh, and to ensure that we do do make sure that we scrutinise um, our bills during the appropriate processes uh, in a manner in which we can make sure that we do our job in this chamber. And I'll tell you a great anecdote, Senator um, Patrick, um, that uh, when I first came into this place, I can remember um, somebody who actually was very well regarded in this place, Senator Amanda Vanstone, and I'm sure even if you weren't in the chamber when Amanda Vanstone held, uh, held her role in this place, you would have heard of her because she was a great South Australian senator. Um, senator Vanstone said to me the day that I was, uh, was uh, chosen to be the person to come into the Senate uh, that she said the one thing you must always remember is that committee work is not optional. She said the most important role of this chamber, the most important role of this Senate is to make sure uh, that, that the committees run appropriately, and that's why I thought I'd take the opportunity this morning to stand up and, uh, and refer, as part of the selection of Bill's committee reporting, to refer to the importance of uh, the fact that the referrals to committees, the scrutiny by committees of bills is tremendously important. And, and I do, I'd certainly thank the, the Chamber for the opportunity to do that because there are a number of bills where the, the application of the scrutiny of, uh, of the legislative um, standing committees makes so much uh, provides so much additional information. And you know, Senator Patrick, I know that you are one of the people in this chamber who believes more than anything else in the importance of the scrutiny of bills through the committee process. Um, you know, you are one of those people that always, when you refer bills to committee, you turn up to the committee hearings. And I commend you for the fact that you are always one who takes the, your role as a member of committees very seriously. You take the scrutiny of bills uh, very, very seriously, as does Senator Seward. I mean, I will you know, commend Senator Seward for the amount of times that she is always prepared to be the person who will stand up uh, and, uh, and, and defend the committee process for the additional scrutiny that it affords bills. Uh, to make sure that we have got the most information, that we allow the consultation and the community engagement into the legislation that we put through this place, because this place truly is the place of review. And the best way that we can review legislation is by enabling uh, a, a broader scrutiny, by being able to take submissions, to consult with the public, to have hearings, to hear what people who are impacted by the legislation that we're putting through this place, to hear from them firsthand how that legislation is likely to impact them, so that we can make sure that decisions that are made in this place in relation to bills are as informed as it possibly can be. So I'd just uh, like to take this opportunity to commend the committee process and thank you for the indulgence to speak on this matter. So I'm going to go to Senator Gallagher and then I'll come to you, Senator Seward. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, uh, thank you um, uh, Mr President. And, uh, I too rise to take this unusual opportunity of being able to um, talk about the Selection of Bills Committee when the Selection of Bills Committee report was in unanimous agreement, as I understand it. Um, usually, it does, it usually it does. Well, because, Senator Seward, the point I'd like to make is draw attention to what is going on here. Uh, and what is going on here, by using this part of the program, is that the government is in a complete mess and they have lost all control of uh, the business of this chamber, all control of it. Because what is happening out there, I have no doubt, is a, a number of people busily trying to write an amendment or a guillotine or an hours motion or all three uh, to deal with the rest of the business of this week after spending three days on one bill. We're up against time now and the government hasn't got even the ability to draft an hours or a guillotine motion done in time to have it dealt with by this chamber. That's what's happening now. And poor Senator Rustin, and I feel for her, has been sent in to waste time in this chamber, waste time when we have important bills that need to be dealt with today, the industrial relations bill, which we don't support, um, job seeker, there's motions, there's the whole program that the government is disrupting through their own inability to deliver anything, it looks like. I can't imagine a situation where this would have occurred under, um, under the previous leadership. I honestly can't. There is absolutely no way that, that Minister Cormann wouldn't have been sitting in that chair with everything zipped up. And what we're faced with today is this ridiculous waste of time because they haven't got their house in order. Not just one house, they haven't got any house in order. The amendments aren't in order. 
the guillotine that's coming our way is not in order and the hours motion isn't in order. And the lives of all those people who are relying on JobSeeker hangs in the balance while they mess around trying to get their ideological war against workers through this parliament. The millions of people relying on JobSeeker and an extension or an, a, a permanent increase to that payment, their, their income hangs in the air through the inability of this team to get anything through this chamber. It's an outrageous waste of this chamber's time. It's outrageous, Order. Senator Rennick. Do you actually have any idea what's going on right at the moment? Do you have Order. any idea? I don't think Order. you do. I don't think you have any idea what's going on and how you would defend the fact that your leadership team can't line matters up. This program has been known forever. Like This is the program. At 11.45, we move to formal business. You've known all week that you need to get this legislation dealt with. You know all that. There's rumours of a guillotine, rumours of an hour motion, rumours of a bill that's about to be gutted, but we don't know if that's actually going to be the case because we haven't seen any of the amendments that are going to be moved. And here we are, wasting time on a debate about selection of bills committee report because you've got nothing else. There's got no other way of dealing Order. with the business of this chamber. Order. It is an absolute mess that this is what the government of Australia is presenting to this chamber. It's an absolute mess. You can't get your program through, you can't get your legislation through, you can't draft an amendment, you can't draft a guillotine and you can't draft an hours motion. You can't do anything. And you know what I'm saying is true. That's why it's so difficult for you. You know exactly what that you know what I'm saying is true because that's what's happening on the floor of this chamber and we should call it out. We should call out that you cannot Organise yourselves to deal with the legislation before this Order chamber. On my right. That it, you are incapable of dealing with it, and then we're going to be given something. We're going to be given no time to consider it, and you're going to crunch it through. And we look at there's a busy shuffling of papers going on around here. So I think we're about to find out how long we're going to be here, what bills we're going to be dealing with. And maybe we'll find out exactly what your industrial relation bill looks like once you've finished your negotiations you. and see whether what we hear is true, that schedules are being ripped out, including wage theft. See if that is actually true. Gutting your own bill. How embarrassing for all of you. How embarrassing. How absolutely embarrassing. I've never Order. seen anything Senator like Gallagher it in this time place. For your contribution. I, I said I'd go to Senator Seward next, Senator Hanson. Senator Seward, are you still seeking the call? Um, no, as long as we are going to hear what's going on. If we continue in this debate, I'm going to ask the question be put. Okay, well, I have a motion before the chair um, if it, that the question be put. And while Senator Hanson is seeking the call, I have to put that procedural motion. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to take that as moving the motion, Senator Seward. Is that fair in your name? The question yes. is that the motion on the selection bills, selection bills committee report be now put. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The question is now that the selection of bills committee report be adopted. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. I imagine Senator Smith. Mr President, if I may, I'd like to move a motion relating to a leave of absence for Senator Brockman. Is leave granted. Leave is granted. Senator Smith. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senator Brockman for today for personal reasons. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those, those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr President. Uh, I seek leave to move a motion relating to the consideration of legislation today. Is leave granted? No. Leave is not granted. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, pursuant to contingent notice of motion standing in my name, I move that so much of the standing orders be suspended as would prevent me moving a motion to provide for the consideration of a matter. Namely, a motion to provide that a motion relating to the consideration of legislation may be moved immediately and determined without amendment or debate. Uh, the motion provides uh, for finalisation of the fair work legislation that the Chamber has been debating for some, some number of days. It provides also for consideration of the social services legislation strengthening income support bill 2021 and non-controversial matters for today. Uh, it preserves the Senate's opportunity to consider formal motions and have them voted upon today, as well as other ordinary business, including question time. 
Uh, I would flag also the government's intention uh, to bring to the chamber later today uh, legislation in relation to the parliamentary uh, inquiry and the protection of information provided to the parliamentary workplaces inquiry. Uh, and I move that the question be now put. Question is that the question be now put. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells. Lock the doors. The question is the motion moved by Senator Birmingham be now put. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Smith tell of the ayes and Senator Urquhart tell of the noes. Ask senators to take their seats for the count.
The result of the division is ayes 34, noes 30. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. The question is now that the motion moved by Senator, okay, Senator Wong seeking the call. Oh, the question is now that the motion moved by Senator Birmingham be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. So. Lock the doors. The question is the motion moved by Senator Birmingham be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Smith teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 33, noes 31. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, I move that, the, that a motion relating to the consideration of legislation may be moved immediately and determined without amendment or debate. And I move that the question be now put. Senator Wong. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted. I thank minute. the Senate. Well, here is a government in crisis. A government in crisis. A government that has had months on this industrial relations bill and now guillotining it. Uh, uh, after not uh, after being so so taken by other crises that they can't negotiate, can't negotiate with the crossbench. Now guillotining this bill, guillotining the next bill, and guillotining the bill after that, order, including job seeker order. legislation. Yeah, come on, shatter me, because that's all you've order. got, isn't it? That's right. all you've got. All you've got is bluster. You've got a part-time right. industrial relations minister who Order. hasn't been able to pay attention, and so now the Senate is, dem is, is seeing the consequences of a government in crisis trying to ram this Order legislation through right. in 20 minutes, Senator ram Rennick. the job seeker legislation through uh, in that time, Senator trying to Rennick, salvage Senator some Van. pride. Salvage some pride by passing a bill that, Order. on your own admission, you're going to Order. gut because you Senator haven't Wong, got the numbers. For the when is, when are we going to have a government that actually Order. does the job for Australians? Order, Senator Wong. Order. Order on my right. Senator Rennick. Senator Rennick. I, when I call senators by name, I expect them to at least temporarily obey the standing orders and remain silent. 
Senator Waters. Leave is granted for one minute. Senator Waters. Well, this government couldn't arrange a chook raffle. Here we have a late hours motion, which has some very tricksy additional consequences. There's a little rule in there that says you can't circulate uh, any more amendments on the IR bill with less than one hour's notice. But hey, presto, there's less than one hour to go. So they've effectively silenced everybody else from circulating any amendments in response to their last minute amendments in relation to protecting workers' rights. The Order. other thing this on motion Monday. successfully does is says that we can't vote on the sports rorts, uh, report that was due to be tabled this afternoon. That my colleague, we can't speak on that. My colleague Senator Rice was going to seek to speak on that because this government is up to its necks in corrupt activity, and they've conveniently ensured that that can't occur either. So this government is in, in an absolute mess, but it's still managed to cover its own rear end on inconvenient matters. Senator Hanson. To make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you very much. <clears throat> again, from the Labor Party in Penny Wong, what a theatrical experience that was to watch that again in floor of Parliament. Order. And for the whole fact is that if you're so worried about the workers of this nation, if you're so worried about this, the small business, and if you're so worried, Senator as Senator Van... Bellick has said, Sen... about we need to pass this for job seeker, Order. then start working Senators to get it passed. Because what? if not, where's your notice of motion then to continue it tonight? Order. Let's stay back tonight. Let's Let's work tonight. Let's let's stay till tomorrow. Where's your notice of motion from, from that? If you're really worried Order about the workers of left. this nation and on the small right. business and and job seeker, where's your notice of motion? The filibustering that's gone on in this parliament and the lies are, are absolutely disgusting. You're not in, you don't want to. You've actually dragged this out because now we've got a six to seven week break in this parliament. If you really care about the, the workers, if you really care about the job seeker, then work to get these bills passed because as far as I'm concerned, you don't Order, give a Senator damn. Order, Senator Hanson. Time for the contribution has expired. Order. Order. When people can't hear me yell with my microphone, that means there's way too much noise in the chamber. Senator Wong. S seek leave to respond very briefly, less than 30 seconds. Is leave is not granted. Oh, you want me to? I'm now going to. I've now got a order. I've now got a. I've got a question before the chair. Sen Senator Wong, I, ha I have a question before the chair. The question is now order. The question is that the question moved by Senator Birmingham be now put. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. It usually comes. Lock the doors. Senators, I am going to insist upon quiet, otherwise the tellers and the clerks cannot do their jobs. I don't think anyone would like me to name anyone right about now, but I am going to insist on quiet for the tellers because they, with noise they cannot conduct the count fairly. The question is, the motion moved by Senator Birmingham be now put. The eyes will move to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Smith, teller for the eyes, and Senator Urquhart, teller for the nose.
The result of the division is ayes 33, noes 31. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. The question now is the motion moved by Senator Birmingham be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is the motion moved by Senator Birmingham be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Smith tell of the ayes and Senator Urquhart tell of the noes. The result of the division is ayes 33, noes 31. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, I move the motion as circulated. question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Wing the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is the motion moved by Senator Birmingham be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Smith tell off the ayes and Senator Urquhart tell off the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 33, noes 31. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. I call the clerk to call debate back on. On business order of the day number one, Fair Work Amendment supporting Australia's Jobs and Economic Recovery Bill 2021, resumption of second reading debate. So, Senator, there being no further speakers, Senator, call, unless there's anyone else seeking the call, I'll call the minister to close debate. Oh, thank you minister. very much, Mr. President. And, uh, I rise to close the debate uh, on the Fair Work Amendment supporting Australia's Jobs and Economic Recovery Bill 2021. I would like to say thank you to those crossbenchers which constructively engaged with the government uh, in order to come to a resolution today, a resolution that will provide greater certainty for those in casual employment and offer them a pathway to permanent employment, but also to provide greater certainty to all those small businesses across Australia. And what I say to the Labor Party and the Greens is this. Shame on you. Shame on you. In 2020, Australia and the world faced a challenge like no other. COVID-19 caused a health crisis that triggered an economic crisis. Mr President, it is a fact that at the height of the pandemic, 1.3 million people lost their job or were stood down to zero hours. The Morrison government made it clear, Mr President, made it clear from day one that we were committed Senator, to backing the Senator Australian Pratt. people. We were committed Senator to Pratt. backing Sorry, Senator the— Senator Cash, can you please— At the end of the sitting period, on very contentious issues, I am going to insist that when I call senators by name, they be quiet for at least a period of time, as a courtesy to their colleagues, if not to me. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And as I was saying, the Morrison government made it clear that we would back the Australian people. We would back the employers that give them a job on a daily basis. The Morrison government made it clear that we were committed to putting Australia on the road to economic recovery and prosperity. And that is why we brought forward the package of what are modest changes to Labor's failed Fair Work Act. Mr President, what I say to the Australian people is this. You have shown tremendous, tremendous resilience and spirit during these testing times. But as we know, Mr President, we are at a critical point in our recovery. And as we navigate ourselves out of the COVID-19 economic crisis, it is our ability to work together, to work together to solve complex problems, working in partnership. That is how we will move forward. That is how we will create jobs. And that is how we will get Australians back to work. And in that regard, Mr President, I do note today that the labour force figures for February came out. Again, we saw job creation in Australia. That is a good thing for the Australian people, and that is because of the economic framework that the Morrison government has put in place. What we also saw, Mr President, was the unemployment rate drop by 0.5 per cent. That should not be underestimated, Mr President, and that is a sign, that is a sign that our economic policies are working. And so today, as a government, we recognise that we do not have the numbers in the Senate. In order to pass legislation, we must negotiate. And again, I thank those in the crossbench who have negotiated openly and constructively with the government. The government today will be proceeding with the passage of Schedule 1 to the Fair Work Act. Mr President, without a doubt, the passage of Schedule 1 will provide greater certainty for casuals and greater certainty for small business. Casual workers will be given a greater opportunity to convert to permanent work. That is a good thing for them. And I would have thought those on the other side who always demonise casual work and say it should be permanent would actually support this change. A clear pathway for casuals to move into a permanent form of work. But, Mr President, perhaps the most crucial part of what I hope 
what I hope will pass the Senate today is that small and family businesses, and as they minister for small and family business, I want to say to the small and family businesses across Australia, the Morrison government, we back you every step of the way. And I thank the crossbench, those on the crossbench, for joining with us to back small and family businesses every step of the way. If the bill passes, you will be saved from a potential liability of up to $39 billion, thanks to Order. the government's removal of the double dipping loophole. Colleagues, that is a $39 billion potential liability that is faced by small and family businesses across Australia if Schedule 1 to the Fair Work Act does not pass today. In the event that Schedule 1 passes, Mr President, this is a significant win for casual workers who perform regular patterns of work and deserve the benefits, deserve the benefits that flow from permanency. If that is what they wish, it is about providing choice. But as I've said, Mr President, the significant part today is the protection of businesses from the double-dipping back pay claims arising from the Rosato case. This will protect jobs into the future, and that is a critical move as Australia's economy strongly, strongly moves out of the economic impacts caused by COVID-19 and the pandemic. Mr President, at a time when the economy is recovering, at a time when businesses are hiring, more employees. And again, we look to the employment figures that were released today. Yet again, we thank the employers across the country. They are the job creators. We put in place the policy framework. They are creating jobs based on that policy framework. But at a time when it is still tough, Labor and the ACTU were willing to let small and family businesses, those businesses across the country, that we rely on as the backbone of the economy, they were prepared to let them be hit by up to $39 billion in a double-dipping wage bill. All that does, Mr President, all that does is say to those businesses, you will be forced to close down. Mr President, we will be introducing a clear definition of what it means to be a casual employee. This is because there is so much uncertainty and has been for so long now around the definition. We will provide certainty to that definition. As I've said, we will also give eligible employees a new statutory pathway to permanent employment on a full-time or part-time basis through a legislated universal casual entitlement. That is a very positive step casual employment moving through to permanent employment. That is a good thing. But we will also, and I have to say, last week I was contacted by the Australian Restructuring Insolvency and Turnaround Association, as I know so many colleagues were. They wrote to me and they said this. Without the provisions in the bill, we remain very concerned that the failure to address these issues, the double dipping issue, will force a significant number of at risk businesses into insolvency, especially in the current environment and at the cost of a massive number of jobs that could otherwise be saved. Mr. President, what the government is pursuing today in Schedule 1 are changes that will help save jobs. They are changes that will help save businesses, and they will provide, as has been called for, Mr. President, for so long now, yes. for so long now, yes. much-needed certainty. The government will also be moving to allow a new small claims process, including the ability for the Fair Work Commission referral to be used to settle disputes about casual conversion rights. That is a good thing, and it allows the disputes to be held efficiently and effectively with a, with, as small claims proceedings. Mr. President, today is all about small business. 
Today is all about ensuring greater certainty for casual employees across Australia. Today, the government will continue to deliver on its job creating agenda. Again, the government has listened to small business. The government has listened to employees. The government has negotiated with the crossbench. And again, I would like to thank those crossbenchers who today are putting small business and casual employees in Australia first. And on that basis, I will commend the bill to the Senate. The question is the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required, ring the bells. Why are you voting against greater work
Lock the doors. The question is the bill will be read a second time. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Smith teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 32, noes 30. The question is resolved in the affirmative. I call the clerk. The bill for an act to amend the Fair Work Act 2009 and the Fair Work Transitional Provisions and Consequential Amendments Act 2009 and for related purposes. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? That being, there being no objection, it is so ordered. Uh, Minister. No, you weren't. I'm the. I'm really moving the government amendment. Thank you, Senator Wong. Thank you. Uh, in, on behalf of Senator Patrick, I seek leave to move items 6 to 14 on sheet 1214 together. Is leave granted? Is leave granted? Is, uh, no, leave is not granted. Okay. Move them one, one by one. This is the this is the deletion of the schedules, and uh, you know the government is now uh, out of a in a fit of pique because they want to move their own amendments to gut their bill rather than Senator Patrick's amendment to gut their bill. Now requiring that they not be moved together. I mean, is the government really going to be that petty? In which case, I I move item six on sheet two one two one four. On behalf, on behalf of Senator Patrick. So the question is that number six on sheet one, two. One, two, move one. So the question is that. Schedule two, standards printed, Minister. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, well, if uh, Senator Wong wants to play these games, that is fine. But Senator Wong, you would be aware that the government has an amendment that effectively removes schedules two to six and divisions three to seven in item one and items two and three of. Sh they will. You are aware of that. So for. If you would like to play these games, you are more than welcome to. However, the government's amendment is to remove schedules two, three, four, five, six, and parts of schedule seven. So the question is that schedule two stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? No. Uh, I believe the noes have it. Senator Wong. Uh, I again ask. On behalf of Senator Patrick, Lee, for leave to move items 7 to 14 on sheet 1214 together. Is leave granted? No. Leave is not granted, Senator Wong. Oh, come on. You've lost. I've... You're I move items. On behalf of Senator Patrick, I move item 7 on sheet 1214. So the question is that order, order, 
So the question is that Schedule 3 standards printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? The noes have it. The noes have it. Senator Wong. I seek leave to move items A to 14 on sheet 1214 together. Is leave granted? No. Leave is not granted. Senator Wong. I move item 8 on sheet 1214 on behalf of Senator Patrick. So the question is that Schedule 4 standards printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? No. I believe the noes have it. The noes have it. Senator Wong. I move item 9 on sheet 1214. On behalf of Senator Patrick. So the question is that that uh, Schedule Six stand is printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? No. I believe the noes have it. The noes have it. Senator Wong. I seek leave to move items ten to fourteen on sheet one two one four together. Is leave granted? I'm just, keep, I'm just keep seeking leave so the Senator can actually, in a guillotine, try and deal with this quickly. I'm seeking leave to move Senator Patrick's amendments item 10 to 14 on sheet 1214 together. Is leave granted? Leave is not granted. Move Senator Senator Wong. Wong. I move item 10 on sheet 1214 on behalf of Senator Patrick. So the question is that Division 2. On of Schedule 7. So the question is order, order, order. Uh, Senator Small. Uh, Madam Deputy President, I, I'd like to draw the Chamber's attention to the discussion that we've been having for a number of days. And that is that the Morrison government has introduced some non-ideological, incremental and measured reforms that are aimed at empowering Australian workers in the workplace to have a right to convert casual employment to permanent employment for the very first time. And instead we see those on the opposition benches voting against that very important and fundamental right. We have sought to improve the agreement-making process to deliver higher wages into the pockets of Australian workers faster, and those on the Labor benches vote against that. We have sought to improve the enterprise agreement process, which Paul Keating has said is broken. Paul Keating has said is broken. And it has fallen to the Liberal Party, the Morrison government, to improve that. And what do we see? What do we see from Labor and the Greens? We see unfounded claims that somehow this is racist and sexist. We have sought to deliver the 69 per cent increase in average earnings under an enterprise agreement compared to awards into the pockets of Australian workers. But no, from those opposite, nothing but unfounded rhetoric uh, and unsubstantiated claims. In all of the contributions that we've heard from around this chamber this week, nothing, no constructive, no constructive opportunity uh, or, or comment from those opposite on Order. how these reforms might be improved. Order. Instead, instead, it has fallen to our crossbench colleagues to Order. very carefully uh, offer on the basis of private consultations that they've been having around Australia with employees, with employer associations and with unions. It has fallen to those crossbench colleagues who come to this place with an open mind and a motivation to see Australians earn more money and keep more of the money that they earn for themselves and their families. And for that, I commend Minister Cash, Minister Birmingham and those other colleagues on the government benches who have recognised those contributions from our crossbench colleagues. So let's turn to some of the detail that seems to be lost in translation here today. $39 billion in double-dipping entitlements is an affront to any fair-minded assessment of what it means Order. to do business in Australia today. And this is not a liability that is just levelled at big corporations and labour hire firms, and that's certainly what we hear from over here. 
but instead it falls to those small businesses who Minister Cash so fiercely advocates for on a daily basis. They are the ones who stand to lose their homes with this egregious double dipping on entitlements. You only needed to read the Financial Review just yesterday to hear stories uh, relating to a dry cleaner in Melbourne. A small business owner stands to lose their house with entitlements that have rightfully been paid to those casual employees who got a 25 per cent loading on the wages that they were paid. These are the sort of people that the Morrison government stands up for. These are the people that those honourable colleagues sitting on the crossbench are prepared to fight for. But instead, from over there, what do we get? Oh no, we get what the unions tell them to do. Uh, because it is the unions who stand to lose through empowering Australian workers to make their own choices. This idea of permanent casualisation somehow being illegitimate where a worker so chooses. Well, frankly, Madam Deputy President, we believe in the capacity for Australians to make that choice for themselves. And in fact, they make that choice for themselves on a Order. daily basis, Madam Order. Deputy President. Because 9 per cent of private sector employees Order. choose to pay hard-earned money to the union movement. So how else do they do it? Well, they go around through industry super funds, which my colleague Senator Bragg points out. Uh, uh, and in fact, $30 million a year is likely to flow from the union super funds through to those unions in donations by 2030. Well, we're not interested in that, Madam Deputy President. We're interested in ensuring that Australians get the opportunities they deserve, they get rewarded for the effort, that they're incentivised to strive. And so far, the track record of the Morrison government speaks very strongly to this. Our employment numbers today, 5.8 per cent unemployment in the Australian economy. But we're not done yet, Senator Ennick. We are not done yet. These reforms uh, offer those permanent part-time employees who work in the hospitality, the accommodation Order. and food services Order. sectors and the retail sector the opportunity to work them more hours, more hours for the very first time Order. under the protections that permanent employment offers them. So those extra hours would be worked uh, with leave entitlements accruing, with the protections from unfair dismissal and with the sorts of protections that we are affording those workers. But instead, with the Labor Party voting against such a sensible, measured, incremental and non-ideological change, the Labor Party seeks to entrench casual employment in the Australian economy. Well, we won't stand for that, Madam Deputy President, and that is why this government has sought to expand the flexibility in the Australian workplace relations system that these opposite so fiercely oppose. But we're not, uh, we're not just solely focused on flexibility uh, and, uh, indeed, offering those casual employees in Australia the ability to convert that employment for the very first time. We've also focused on the, frankly, broken uh, agreement-making process in this country. Now, we're just 9 per cent of Australian workers in the private sector, as I just mentioned, uh, choose to fork out for union membership. That means that 91 per cent of Australians see no role for the Australian union movement in their workplace—91 per cent. So why? So why is it that the union movement continues to obstruct non-union agreements being moved through the Fair Work Commission, those very same agreements that put 69 per cent extra earnings in the pockets of hard-working Australians. Well, this government is seeking to make changes that expedite that agreement-making process with 21-day approvals. We've heard criticism that that is a tick-and-flick exercise, but that fundamentally ignores the fact that ignores the fact that the Fair Work Commission, under these sensible reforms, has the capacity to extend the period of approval where the merits of the case so confirm. However, Order. have we heard a single evidence-based factual reflection on that provision from those opposite? No, we have not, Madam Deputy President. But when we come to wage theft, wage exploitation and underpayment Order. in Australia, we have Order. been clear that the Morrison government will not stand for it. 
We will not stand for it, Madam Deputy President. And so we have sought to increase uh, the provisions related Senator to Pratt. criminal and civil penalties Senator on those Pratt. employers that do the wrong thing. And I'm sure that's something Senator Pratt would be so proud of if she could bring herself to come and support those workers over here with the Morrison government. For the very first time, there would be a criminal penalty, but you have decided to vote against it. So at the end of the day, we've got a government who is on the side of those employees who have been exploited, uh, who have Small. been underpaid. Senator we Small, sorry. resume your seat. Senator Rennick. In of order, uh, Madam Deputy President, I think we should. Uh, could you please ask the other side of the chamber to be quiet, please? Uh, Senator Small Thank has employed you, more Rennick. people. That entire other uh, side Senator of the chamber Rennick, has ever employed. Your seat. I would ask everyone to please allow Senator Small to uh, finish his contribution in silence. Thank you, Senator Small. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. So, finally, if we're not uh, interested in the rights of Australians to convert that employment for the first time, if we're against putting more money uh, through improved agreement making in the pockets of Australians, if you're against somehow increases in the criminal and civil penalties that apply uh, in instances of wage theft or underpayment, somehow those opposite also find themselves against Greenfields projects that mandate annual pay rises for the employees covered by them. Frankly, I find it staggering that the Labor Party are voting against mandated annual pay rises for employees involved in the construction of mega projects, those same mega projects that drive jobs, that drive taxation revenue, that help to pay for the services that support those most vulnerable in the Australian community. The Morrison government for that. The crossbench are prepared to vote for that, but it is the Labor Party and the Greens who time and time again find themselves unable to support hard-working Australians who deserve Order. to be rewarded for their Order. efforts, who deserve more Order. of their earning. Uh, Senator Wong. Well, what is so humiliating about that? <laughs> what is so humiliating about that is this bloke is sent out to argue for a bill where he doesn't even know that they've ditched most of what he speaks about. They've ditched most of what he's having a go about. How humiliating! A government so in crisis, you can't even tell a member of your own team, oh, by the way, we've ditched that bit and that bit and that bit and that bit, and you come in here, you come in here and start to proselytise about provisions of a bill the minister's going to ditch. Order. What a joke! If you ever wanted a demonstration of a governing crisis, it was that pathetic contribution. What a humiliation uh, from Senator Small. What a humiliation. You don't even tell you what they're doing. I seek leave to move Order. items 11 to 14 on sheet 1214. Oh, sorry. Is that still on? I apologise. Ten. Yes. Yeah. So the question is that Division Two on Schedule Seven be agreed to, uh, Minister. Um, Mr. President, COVID-19 has actually changed the dynamic of the Australian economy. It has made us focus as a society on what we need to do to ensure that businesses are able to stay in business and to ensure that employees are able to stay in work. And what we are seeing on display by the Australian Labor Party today is nothing more and nothing less than absolute contempt. Contempt for small businesses in Australia who need to be protected from the $39 billion hit that they are facing because of the double-dipping back bay claims arising from the Rosato case. But we are also putting forward today certainty, long-awaited certainty in relation to the definition of casual employment. This is something, Deputy President or Chair, that Australian businesses and Australian employees have been asking for now 
for a very, very long time. What we see, it was uncertain, and I will take, I will take that interjection, Senator Scar, because Labor failed to do anything, to do anything about this in their Fair Work Act. Labor's Fair Work Act has unfortunately created the confusion that we are seeing today. Casual employees and the businesses that support them, they deserve certainty. They deserve certainty in their employment relationship, both employers and employees alike. But casual employees also deserve to have a pathway set out for them to permanent employment. And again, when you listen to how the Labor Party talk about casuals and the nature of casual employment, Mr President, you have to ask why. Why is it that the Labor Party today in the chamber are not prepared to support a measure that will provide, will provide that pathway to permanency for casual employees who do work that regular pattern of work. Mr President or Madam Deputy President, greater uh, certainty Senator for Cash, casuals please resume your seat. and great— Minister, please resume your seat. It is now 1pm. The time for this debate has expired. It is my intention to re-put that motion so those in favour of division— before the chair. The, the question is the question that's been before the chair for 10 minutes. That is division two, schedule seven, stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. The noes have it. Division, uh, yes. division required. Yes. Ring the bells for four minutes.
So the question is that Division 2 on Schedule 7 stand as printed. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Dean Smith as teller for the ayes and Senator McCarthy as teller for the noes. Order. There being 33 ayes and 31 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I will now. Senator Wong. Move opposition amendments on sheet 1254 together. Yes. Is leave granted? No. My understanding. Yes. Yes. Sorry. Yes. Yes. So the question is that the uh, amendments is moved by. We'll just uh, seek some clarification to make sure everyone understands. No, me. <laughs> A Deputy President, uh, uh, if you look at page yes, two uh, of just Senator Wong. Yep, go on. Sorry, page yep. two of the yep. running sheet. I th as I understand, we, I am seeking to move the opposition amendments in the bottom box, yes. which is one and four to seven on sheet one two five four by agreement. That will require two and three to be moved separately, as per the clerk's advice. Yep. Yes. Yep. As uh, indicated to the Senate, I'll put these two separately. So the first question is that the amendments be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the ayes have it. No, have Division it. required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
order, I lock the doors. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Wong that the amendments be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McCarthy as teller for the ayes and Senator Dean Smith as teller for the noes. Order. There being 32 ayes and 32 noes, the votes being equal, the question is resolved in the negative. I now intend to move to the second part of the motion Senator Wong moved, and that is that subsection 5463A in item 4 and subsection 548D7 in item 10 of Schedule 5 stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Against? I uh, believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. I know.
Lock the doors. So the question is that subsection 5463A in item 4 and subsection 548D7 in item 10 of schedule 5 stand as printed. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Dean Smith as teller for the ayes and Senator McCarthy as teller for the noes. Order. So the question is that the ayes 32, the noes are 32, the votes being equal, the question is resolved in the negative. So for clarity, that means that those subsections of Schedule 5 will be removed from the bill. I will now deal with the circulated amendments to the bill, starting with the remaining government amendments on sheet PX114. So the question is that Schedule 5 and Divisions 3 to 7 of Schedule 7 and items 2 and 3 of Schedule 7 stand as printed. Senator Wong. Thank, thank you, Deputy President. Uh, on behalf of the opposition, could I ask that the following questions be put separately? Um, the question on Schedule 5 and, the, and Division 6 of Schedule 7 be put separately so the opposition can vote accordingly. So the question is that Schedule 5 and Divisions and Division 6 uh, stand of Schedule 7 stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. Uh, I believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
order. I lock the doors. So the question is that Schedule 5 and Division 6 of Schedule 7 stand as printed. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McCarthy as teller for the ayes and Senator Dean Smith as teller for the noes. Order. There being 32 ayes and 32 noes, the vote being equal, the question is resolved in the negative. So the items are again removed uh, from the bill. I'll now move to the second part of that amendment, which was asked to be split. So that question is divisions 3, 4 and 7 of Schedule 7 and items 2 and 3 of Schedule 7 stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? No. I believe the noes have it. The noes have it. So the question now is that amendments 1 to 8 on sheet PX114 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. Uh, the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
order of the doors. So the question is that amendments 1 to 8 on sheet PX114 be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Dean Smith as teller for the ayes and Senator McCarthy as teller for the noes. Order. There being 34 ayes and 30 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I will now deal with the remaining. Beg your pardon, Senator Wong. Uh, thank you. Um, in order to deal with uh, the consequences for the opposition's voting position, and I think also the Australian Greens, I, I would like to seek leave to move in my items 1 to 11 on sheet 1220 together. Is leave granted? So, yes. I'm, so I move items 1 to 11 on sheet 1220 together, noting that this question will need to be put separately on items 2 and 7. So the question now is that subsection 66C2 in item 3 of Schedule 1 and subclauses 46.1 to 4 in item 1 of Schedule 7 uh, be agreed to. Standards printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. Uh, I believe the noes have it. Uh, ring the bells for four minutes.
going to happen when we get to 145? Order, lock the doors. So the question is that uh, subsection 66C2 in item 3 of Schedule 1 and subclauses 46.1 to 4 in item 1 of Schedule 7 stand as printed. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Dean Smith. Uh, I remind senators once I've called the tellers, you need to be sitting down. Uh, so I'm calling Senator Dean Smith as teller for the eyes and Senator McCarthy as teller for the nose. Uh, Senator Wong. Can we, can we not commence the division until we have people seated? I, I did warn uh, people, Senator Wong, that I was about to commence the so just to remind the Senate, once the tellers are appointed, you need to be sitting down, otherwise you won't be counted. So, uh, Senator, I will ask the count be uh, started again. Senator Dean Smith and Senator McCarthy, thank you. Order. There being 33 ayes and 31 noes, the matter 
The question is resolved in the affirmative. I now intend to go to the second part of that question. Um, so the question now is that the remaining amendments on sheet 1220, as moved by Senator Wong, uh, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the noes have it. Aye. Ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Yeah, true. Yeah. Order. Lock the doors. So the question now is that the remaining amendments on sheet 1220, uh, as circulated by the opposition, be agreed to. 
the, the ayes were moved to the right of the chair, the noes to the left by appoint Senator McCarthy as teller for the ayes and Senator Dean Smith as teller for the noes. Order. There being 32 ayes and 32 noes, the uh, votes being equal, the question is resolved in the negative. Senator Wong. Thank you. So, on behalf of Senator Patrick, uh, where is he? I'm just making sure he knows that I'm doing this. <laughs> on behalf of Senator Patrick. I move item 5 on sheet 1214. So the question Where is, is that uh, the amendment as moved by Senator Wong be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Beg your pardon. Beg your pardon. So the question is that the motion as moved by uh, Senator Wong. It's five. It's number five on sheet one two one four. That schedule. What? Beg your pardon. That schedule one stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Against. No. I believe the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
lock the doors. So the question is that uh, Schedule 1 on sheet 1214 stand as printed. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Dean Smith as teller for the ayes and Senator McCarthy as teller for the noes. Order. There being 33 ayes and 31 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. Um, Senator Patrick, given that um, the order, given that Amendment 1 on sheet 1214 is consequential to the one we've just passed, I'm wondering if you might seek leave to withdraw that um, that amendment. Senator yeah. Patrick. Yeah, I'll seek leave to withdraw that amendment. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you. Senator Roberts. Thank you. I move the amendment on sheet 1228 in my name. Thank you. So the question is that the amendment as moved by Senator Roberts be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. I believe the ayes have it. Okay. To ring the bells for four minutes.
order. Lock the doors. So the question is that the motion, as moved by Senator Roberts, uh, that one and two on sheet one one two eight, by leave together, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair. The noes to the left. I appoint Senator Dean Smith as teller for the ayes and Senator McCarthy as teller for the noes. Order. There being 36 ayes and 32 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senator Roberts. Thank you. I move the amendment on sheet uh, 1249 revised uh, in the name of Pauline Hanson's One Nation pa Party. So the question is that the amendments as moved by Senator Roberts be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? No. I uh, believe the ayes have it. Divi division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. One minute. Beg your pardon. Ring the bells for one minute. Order. Lock the doors. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Roberts that the amendments 1 to 9 on sheet 1 to 4 9 uh, revised by leave together be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Dean Smith as teller for the ayes and Senator McCarthy as teller for the noes.
order, there being 35 ayes and 32 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. So, Senator Roberts, I'm just wondering uh, if you're seeking to withdraw the remainder of your um, amendments, 1250, 1251, 1252 and uh, 1253 being the sheets. Senator yes, Roberts. I am. So you're yeah. seeking leave? Yes, seek leave to. Is leave, leave granted? granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, um, Senator Roberts. I think now move to Senator Griff and I'll just give him a moment to get back to his uh, seat. So, Senator Griff, I'm just asking if you want to seek leave to remove uh, items three to six uh, I would, on I, schedule five. I would like to uh, have three and seven put and the others removed. Three and seven? Separately, yes. Uh, three deals with schedule five, which has been which removed has been from done. the bill. Okay. I think we were. I was expecting you to move one, two, and seven, uh, Senator Griff. Beg your pardon, Senator Griff. I'll just be very clear again. Um, I thought you would be seeking to move number seven. Yes, yes, number seven. And I, and you are seeking leave to remove the others that I mentioned. Some of them have been dealt with by the government. Uh, yes. I'll... Senator Wong. I would make a suggestion so Senator Griff can get advice, because it, this has obviously been quite confusing, and the government are asserting that some of these amendments have been dealt with, but I have to say I haven't compared these, um, Senator Griff's amendments with the government's for this purpose. So can we vote on seven? Seven, yep. And perhaps Senator Griff, in that time, we can have a four-minute division, can get advice on the remainder. So the question, uh, Minister? Thanks, um, thanks, Deputy uh, Chair. Uh, my uh, advice is that items one and two uh, related to small claims um, uh, um, hearings have, are duplicates of amendments that the government has uh, already moved and have been accepted by the chamber. Yeah, I, and at this point, Senator Griff has moved seven, so uh, we can clarify the rest when we put that to the vote. Senator Griff, you. Seeking the call? Uh, yes, I, yes, I am. I mean, three, four, and seven would be what I would wish to move. Um, Senator Griff, um, what, what I think would be the best way forward, given three and four don't um, no longer relate, uh, they relate to a schedule that's removed from the bill, is that I think you're fairly comfortable that we move on seven and then you can seek some ad further advice. So the question is that the motion, um, as moved by Senator Griff, to deal with uh, number seven on, on 1265 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the ayes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells. I think we're ringing the bells for four minutes.
Order. Lock the doors. So the question is that number seven on sheet 1265 is moved by Senator Griff be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McCarthy as teller for the ayes and Senator Dean Smith as teller for the noes. Order, there being 34 ayes and 34 noes, uh, the question is resolved in the negative. Um, I think we now go to Senator Griff. Senator Griff. Okay, uh, we won't, we, I won't be uh, moving those remaining. Uh, leave is thank you. Grant, leave leave granted. is granted to withdraw. Thank yes. You. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Uh, a supplementary explanatory memorandum that has been circulated relating to the government amendments moved to this bill. Thank you, Minister. So I now intend to report uh, to the Senate. that the uh, Senate has agreed to the bill with amendments. The question now is that the remaining stages of the bill be agreed to and the bill now be passed with an amendment to the title. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. So the question now is that the remaining stages of the bill be agreed to and the bill be now passed with an amendment to the title. Uh, the ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Dean Smith as teller for the ayes and Senator McCarthy as teller for the noes. Order, there being 35 ayes and 33 noes, the question is resolved in the affirmative. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Fair Work Act 2009 yes. and for related purposes. Senators, the time allotted for debate on the Social Services Legislation Amendment Strengthening Income Support Bill 2021 has expired in accordance with the resolution agreed to earlier today. I will now put the questions on the remaining stages of the bill and then put the questions on the remaining stages of the other bills listed in that resolution. I will first deal with second reading amendments circulated by the Australian Greens. These are on sheets 1262 and 1267 AG. The question is that the second reading amendments on sheets 1262 and 1267 circulated by the Australian Greens be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The noes have it. The noes have it. Senator Waters. Yes, can we just ask that the two separate second reading amendments in fact be put separately, given okay. that they are separate amendments and we, people we, will vote differently on them? I, I need someone to actually assert who will be voting differently on them. Senator Lambie, okay, I'm happy to do that. Sorry, I, I can't do it because they're your amendments. So I will then recommit these. The question is, with the leave of the chamber, I'll recommit that matter and I'll deal with them separately. The question is now that the second reading amendments on sheets 1262 circulated by the Australian Greens be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The noes have it. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells. Sorry, Senator Lambie, hey, you're so taking the call. So there's been a bit of confusion here. What I wanted was item A to be separated from item B and taken separately. If I can do that, please. Okay. Can sorry, someone, sorry, yeah, no, that's Mr. Okay. President. Um, can someone get me a copy of the Look. amendments? I've got a, a script, but I just so I can know which which part of the amendment is being dealt with. I'll cancel the division with the leave of the chamber. Thank you. So on sheet one two six. 
two revised. Senator Lambie, you would like A dealt with separately from B and C. Is that correct? That, that's correct, okay. Mr. Okay. So the Mr. question Mr. Thank is you. that clause A of the second reading amendment on sheet 1262 revised be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The noes have it. Would you like, look, given the operation, I'll give Senator Waters a few seconds to deal with. The question is that, referring to sheet 1262 revised, that clause A of that second reading amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question is the clause A of the second reading amendment on sheet 1262 revised be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator C. What tell of the ayes? Senator Ciccone, tell of the noes. The result of the division is ayes 12, noes 38. The matter is resolved in the negative. The question is now that clauses B and C of the second reading amendment on sheet 1262 revised be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is that clauses B and C on sheet 1262 revised be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator C. What tell of the ayes and Senator Ciccone tell of the noes?
The result of the division is ayes 9, noes 41. The matter is resolved in the negative. The question now is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Waters on sheet 1267 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is that the second reading amendment on sheet 1267 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator C. What tell if the ayes. Senator Ciccone, tell if the noes. The result of the division is ayes 12, noes 39. The matter is resolved in the negative. I will now deal with the second reading amendment circulated by the opposition. The question is that the second reading amendment on sheet 1243 be agreed to. Those of that by the opposition. By, uh, so the question is that the second reading amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question is that the second reading amendment on sheet 1243 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Ciccone tell off the ayes and Senator Smith tell off the noes. The result of the division is ayes 31, noes 34. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senator Seawood, I understand you are going to seek the call. Thank you, Mr President. I seek leave to table my second reading uh, contribution to the, uh, to the debate on this bill. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I understand it was by agreement. Thank you, Senator Seawood. The question now is the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to social security and for related purposes. I will now deal with the circulated requests and amendments to the bill, starting with those circulated by the Australian Greens. It is it the wish of the committee that the statement accompanying the requests circulated for this bill be incorporated in Hansard immediately after the request to which they relate? There being no objection, it is so ordered. So the question now is that on sheets 1219, 1221, 1222 and 1223, that items 24, 25, 28, 29, 31 and 32 stand as printed. The question is that be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. I'm going off a, a script here, Senator. Um, sorry, Senator Waters. Thank you. Forgive me, but I'm just confused as to why our amendments are all being moved together despite being on different sheets. So, so that's, that's hence my confusion. So if you wouldn't mind. Yep. So and I'll look at the clerk to correct me. My memory of such matters is when we are dealing with um, matters under a limitation of time debate, unless there's an inconsistency that, and or someone asks for them to be dealt with separately, they are dealt with together. Is that correct? Thank you, Deputy Clerk. So the question is, do you want me to put that again? No. They can only be put separately if someone's going to vote separately on them. Okay, so I'm, I, I'm going to put it. I'm going to move on to the next matter, and that the question that those items stand as printed um, was carried. The question now is that the remaining requests and amendments circulated by the Australian Greens be agreed to. Senator Seward. You're saying they stand as printed. 
the My understanding is is that they're not that that is not the right question. You've conflated four that are agreed to. So, the advice I've just received, Senator Seward, is that because your amendments seek to remove them from the bill, the question is that, the, that they stand as printed, and that to support your amendments you would vote no to that motion. That. No, no need to apologise. I think we're being put together. We definitely want to ask you to put that again. Because okay. We can divide. Sure. All right. We well, with the leave of the chamber, I'm going to put that again. Do people need me to read it again, or are they clear? They're clear. So the question is that be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Four minutes. One minute then, sorry. One minute. Lock the doors. The question is the motion be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator McGrath tell of the ayes and Senator Seawitt tell of the noes. The result of the division is ayes 41, noes 9. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. The question now is that the remaining requests and amendments circulated by the Australian Greens be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute.
Lock the doors. The question is that the remaining requests and amendments circulated by the Australian Greens be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Seawitt teller for the ayes, Senator Ciccone teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes, 9, noes 43. The matter is resolved in the negative. I will now deal with amendments circulated by the opposition. The question is that amend— Yes, Senator Gallagher. Opposition amendment on, on sheet 1244. You need leave to do that. I is leave, leave granted? I seek leave. leave. Lots is of leave. Granted. Yep. Senator Hanson or Senator Roberts. Um, as these amendments were circulated after 12.45 today, leave would be required for them to be considered. I'll call on you to seek leave for them to be considered, or— uh, No, I'll be withdrawing the amendment. Seek I'm leaving to withdraw yes, them? Yes, that's right. Seek is leave, leave granted? To... Well, it's not necessary, but I'll be okay. withdrawn. So the question now is that the remaining stages of this bill be agreed to and this bill be now passed. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. Purposes. I will now deal with the Industry Research and Development Amendment Industry Innovation and Science Australia Bill 2021, the Special Recreational Vessels Amendment Bill 2021, the Work Health and Safety Amendment Norco Norfolk Island Bill 2021. And the question now is that the remaining stages of these bills be agreed to and the bills be now passed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. 
A bill for an act, to, uh, the Industry Research and Development Amendment, Industry Innovation and Science Australia Bill 2021, Regulatory Powers Standardisation Reform Bill 2020, Special Recreation v Vessels Amendment Bill 2021, Workplace Health and Safety Amendment, Norfolk Island Bill 2021, and Industrial Chemicals Bill. Uh, Sorry, Industrial Chemicals Legislation Amendment Bill 2020, Industrial Chemicals Environment Management Register Bill 2020, Industrial Chemicals Environment Management Register Charge General Bill 2020, Industrial Chemicals Environment Management Register Charge Customs Bill 2020, Industrial Chemicals Environment Management Register Charge Excise Bill 2020. I will now deal with the Regulatory Powers Standardisation Reform Bill 2020. I understand there is an addendum to the EM. I call the Minister. The explanatory memorandum relating to the government amendments to this bill. The question now is that the remaining stages of the bill be agreed to and this bill be now passed. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Regulatory Powers Standard Provisions Act 2014 and to apply that act to various Commonwealth Acts and for related purposes. I will now deal with the Biosecurity Amendment Clarifying Conditionally Non-Prohibited Goods Bill 2021. I call the Minister. Present the bill and, now, and uh, move that it now be read a first time. The question is the bill be now read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Biosecurity Act 2015 and for related purposes. I call the minister to table the explanatory mem memorandum relating to the bill. Senator Dunningham. I table the explanatory memorandum relating to the bill. The question now is that the remaining stages of this bill be agreed to and this bill be now passed. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. I will now deal with the industrial. Oh, sorry, the clerk. Um, a bill for an act to amend the Biosecurity Act 2015 and for related purposes. I will now deal with the Industrial Chemicals Environmental Management Register Bill 2020 and four related bills. I have received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the bills for concurrence. Minister. I move that the bills be now read a first time. The question is the bills be read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. Sorry, it was families. Sorry. Um, in Industrial Chemicals Environmental Management Register Charge Excise Bill 2020, Industrial Chemicals Environmental Management Register Charge Customs Bill 2020, Industrial Chemicals Environmental Management Register Charge General Bill 2020, Industrial Chemicals Environmental Management Register Bill 2020, Industrial Chemicals Legislation Amendment Bill 2020. The question now is that the remaining stages of these bills be agreed to and these bills be now passed. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. Industrial Chemicals Legislation Amendment Bill 2020, Industrial Chemicals Environmental Management Register Bill 2020, Industrial Chemicals Environmental Management Register Charge General Bill 2020, Industrial Chemicals Environmental Management Register Charge Customs Bill 2020, Industrial Chemicals Environmental Management Register Charge Excise Bill 2020. I will now deal with the Family Assistance Legislation Amendment Early Childhood Education and Care Coronavirus Response and Other Measures Bill 2021. I have received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the bill for concurrence. Senator Dunningham. I move the bill be now read for the first time. The question is the bill be read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. Bill for an act to amend the law relating to family assistance and for related purposes. The question now is that the remaining stages of the bill be agreed to and the bill be now passed. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. To amend the law relating to family assistance and for related purposes. Thanks, Senators. Pursuant to order, the, question shall now, the Senate shall now move the questions without notice. Oh. Is that your water? Yes. And I call Senator Ayres. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Why did the Morrison government decide to launch the coronavirus booking website 
five days earlier than the medical appointment booking industry had been told. Does the minister understand the extent of the chaos that followed as a result? Is this an example of the minister's claim that the vaccine rollout is, and I quote, going quite well? The minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank uh, Senator for his question. And, uh, Mr. President, I think that the ramp up of the rolling of the rollout of the vaccination process continues uh, to order con continues to progress. And Mr. President, and 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 yes, I, it is actually I think going quite well, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, yesterday was always going to be a busy day. Yesterday was always going to be, busy, be a busy day. The first day where Australians could contact. There uh, was, was, was always going to uh, be a day where people uh, sought to gain access to the vaccine, Mr. President. Uh, and in fact, 98 per cent of those people who uh, checked the website to check whether they were uh, eligible for the vaccine got through on the first time. Got through it the first time. 98 per cent, 381,000 people, Mr. President. Mr. President, so Order. well that's not true, Senator. Some people can book on online, Mr. President. And this and this vaccination process was always going to start slowly and build up. And as I said yesterday, Australians need Order. must be patient. They should be patient. Every Australian who wants a vaccination will have access to a vaccination, Mr. President. And we are scaling up the rollout of the vaccine as more vaccines become available. Uh, and we will continue to do that, Mr. President. We said that we'd start the Pfizer vaccine rollout in February, and we did. We said we'd start the AstraZeneca rollout in early March, and we did. And we've and we've now said uh, and we've now started the, the rollout of Phase B, which will commence next week, Mr. President. And Mr. President, can I say to all of those in doctor surgeries, thank you for your forbearance. To to all of those on the on the phone lines yesterday. Thank you for the work that you did. And can I say to all Australians seeking a vaccination, be patient, be polite, and Order, you will get the Senator vaccination Colbeck. when Senator you need Ayers, it. Senator a supplementary question. In stark contrast, industry sources have said that they were told the booking website was going live next Monday and that the early launch, and I quote, eroded patients' trust in, on in online bookings in one day. Was the Morrison government so desperate for a good news day that it was prepared to erode confidence in the booking system on day one? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. The only, the only people eroding the confidence in the vaccine roll is, is the relentless negativity of those on the other side, Mr. President, Order. who at every turn and at every opportunity try to tear the process down, Mr. President. We have always said that we would build the rollout of the vaccine as more vaccine became available and mr president that's what we are doing mr president so the relentless negativity of those on the other side is the thing that's eroding the confidence in people uh, on the vaccine rollout mr president and as, and as i said 381000 people yesterday were able to access the website at their first opportunity 98% of those who wanted to access the website, Mr. President. So it's the relentless negativity of Labor and those on the other side that are causing, causing uh, concerns about the vaccine rollout. Uh, and we will continue to ramp up the vaccination process Order, as I've Senator said, as more vaccine Senator becomes Ayers, available. A final supplementary question. In response to the vaccine booking bungle and the delayed rollout, Liberal Premier of New South Wales, Gladys Berejiklian, has said, and I quote, what is occurring now isn't a surprise to me or the New South Wales government, and that reaching the vaccine targets, and I quote, will not happen in the current program. When even the Liberal Premier of New South Wales has no confidence in the Morrison government, how can anyone else? Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, uh, one, one thing that you learn in this place is not to take everything that Labor say at face value, because their record of misrepresentation is probably better than any other record that they have, Mr. President. They could not 
they could, they could not uh, make a statement that stacks up if they tried, Mr. President. Mr. President, as I've said, we will continue to scale up the rollout of the vaccine as more vaccine becomes available. The states, Mr. President, will play their part in that, Mr. President, along with doctors' surgeries, uh, in-reach teams into residential aged care facilities, and pharmacists around the country, as well as Commonwealth based vaccination clinics as they all come online, Mr President, and a hundred of those will come online next week, Mr President. So we will continue to ramp up the, the vaccination process with the availability of uh, vaccine, and none of Labor's relentless negativity will hold us back. Senator Molan. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Can the minister update the Senate on how the Morrison government's economic recovery plan is working to create a stronger economy with more jobs? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks very much, Mr. President. I thank Senator Molan for his question, and I know his deep interest in seeing the success of Australia, in seeing the continued success of our economy, and in seeing continued jobs growth for Australians. And the good news, the great news for Australians today is that that jobs growth as part of our economic recovery plan has continued and is continuing strongly. Indeed, Mr President, we welcome today the fact that the unemployment rate has fallen from 6.3 per cent to 5.8 per cent in February. Employment has increased by some 88,700 people. Mr President, to be back above its March 2020 levels. Let all senators just reflect on that fact for a moment. Employment in Australia is back above the levels that existed in March 2020. The overall increase in employment was driven, driven by full-time jobs. In fact, full-time jobs grew by some 89,100. And indeed, as Senator Abetz said before, you'd expect some cheering from those opposite. You would expect some positivity from those opposite, rather than the deathly silence the deathly silence that the merchants of doom and gloom over there have. You know, they, want, you know, they want the vaccine program to fail. They want the economy to fail. They just want to see negative outcomes. They don't want to celebrate in Australia's success. We know there's a job to continue to do, and we are determined to keep doing that job. But we welcome the fact that building on the first two quarters Order. in Australia's history of back-to-back 3% plus growth, we have seen that translate into jobs growth. And that jobs growth means more opportunities for more Australians, more security for more Australian families, and our policies are designed to keep that going into the future. Senator Mole, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. And based on those figures, can the minister inform the Senate on how the government's strong economic management is creating more jobs? and what confidence this provides as we transition out of emergency and temporary support measures. Senator Birmingham. Mr President, it's been the greatest global shock to the economy since the Great Depression. But our policies and the approach that we've taken in Australia and the work of Australian businesses and Australian people have kept Australia safe and secure. They've kept our economy strong, and that is evidenced in terms of these job figures. Indeed, Mr President, today we've seen Prime Minister Gillard's former economic adviser Stephen Kukoulos described these figures as, and I quote, some pretty good labour force numbers, whichever way you cut it. This recovery has been remarkably good, he said. This recovery has Order. been remarkably good, he says. Order. And indeed, Mr President, we are pleased to see the recovery continuing. But we know, Mr President, that more work needs to be done, that we continue to work through the policies that are necessary to keep delivering for Australians, but already unemployment is above the forecast of the RBA, better than the forecast of the Treasury, and those jobs Order. are Senator good Birmingham. news for all Senator Australians. Senator Mullen, a final supplementary question. Uh, can the minister update the Senate on further measures the government is taking to support the next phase of our economic recovery? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr President, under our economic recovery plan, we've been investing some $251 billion of economic support to Australians, to businesses, to households, to families across the country. And that continues. Significant parts of that economic support package 
continue. And of course, we have added to it in recent weeks as well. As we enter the next phases with the end of the JobKeeper program that we introduced with the largest single intervention ever in the Australian economy, we have subsequently implemented a $1.2 billion tourism and aviation recovery package, providing 800,000 half-price airfares across the country to get Australians travelling, to make sure we support those sectors that we need to target to continue to save and to create jobs for Australians. Our SME loan guarantee scheme, widely welcomed by businesses, providing some $40 billion in lending support, all of it designed to keep the jobs growth we're seeing going into the future. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. This morning, the President of the European Commission indicated the previous blockage of exports of the vaccine to Australia would not be a one-off. Does the Minister for Health stand by his previous assurance that the European Commission blocking the international shipment of vaccines will, and I quote, not affect the pace of the rollout? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thanks, Senator Brown, for her question. Um, Mr. President, we are in a very, very fortunate position in this country that we have a sovereign capacity with respect to the manufacture of vaccines. Uh, and we, we will have in this country uh, approximately 50 million doses of AstraZeneca vaccine that will be made in Australia, and they start coming online. Uh, later this month, Mr. President, and, and, that, and that capacity will continue to ramp up. And as that capacity ramps up, so will the supply, for, uh, the, so will the vaccination rate uh, and the supplies that we uh, distribute to providers out to uh, our vaccination uh, processes around the country, Mr. President. So our vaccination process in this country is largely reliant on our sovereign capacity. We have other capacities, of course. We continue to receive uh, regular uh, shipments of Pfizer vaccine, and of course those are being applied through the process. Well, uh, Mr. Senator, I'll take Senator Watts' interjection. We continue to receive, uh, based on our schedules, our, our, our supplies of Pfizer vaccine, and we are extremely fortunate, Mr. President, extremely fortunate that we have contracted the local manufacture of 50 million doses of Australian-made. Uh, AstraZeneca vaccine, which will start ramping up as of later this month and through April, Mr. President. So that next week, over 1,000. Next week, over 1,000 GPs will start vaccinating process, increasing to over four and a half thousand uh, during April, Mr. President. So the supplies will increase based on our sovereign manufacturing capacity, uh, and the ramping up of the vaccination process will continue. Uh, as that sovereign capacity comes on supply, and later in the year, Mr. President, uh, we we look to other su other supplies being available as they go through Order, the Senator appropriate Colbeck. approval Senator processes. Senator Brown, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. On Tuesday, the minister representing the Minister for Health said, and I quote, "Other vaccines may come online to support the vaccination of Australians as the approved process continues." End quote. What other vaccines was the minister referring to? What negotiations are underway to secure these other vaccines? Senator Colbeck. Well, Mr. President, it would be really good if Labor listened to what has been said by the government over a period of time, rather Order. than trying to misrepresent it in the chamber, Mr. President. Uh, as I've said in the chamber before, and the Minister of Health has also said in the chamber before, we have access to 20 million doses of Pfizer vaccine. We have access to uh, 50, million dollars, 50 million doses of vaccine that is being manufactured in Australia. We are looking to, we are looking to the potential for 51 million doses of Novavax, Mr. President, pending its regulatory approval. Mr. President. So there are, and it has been well publicised over a period of time, uh, and of course we also have access to 25.6 million doses through the COVAX structure. So, Mr. President, there are a number of other sources of vaccine to make up that 150 million doses that we have coming on stream, Mr. President. And so, those Order. as they are Senator approved Colbeck, and become available, the answer will has be available expired. To Senator Colbeck, time for the answer has expired. Senator Keneally, Senator Brown is on her feet. A final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. 
Given the effect of the slow and bungled rollout of the vaccination program on the economy and jobs, is the Morrison government now reconsidering ending JobKeeper in just 10 days? Senator Colbeck. Well, Mr. President, I completely reject the premise of the question. Uh, we have continued to grow and build the rollout of va the vaccine, vaccine, COVID vaccines across this country as we said we would. We have continued and, and in line with su available supply, Mr. President. In line with available supply. We're in a very enviable position in this country, Mr. President, where we have been able to start the vaccination process with a full assessment of each of the vaccines that we're applying by our world leading Therapeutic Goods Administration. And instead of the relentless negativity of Labor who seek to undermine the confidence in the vaccination process. It would be good if the Labor Party continues, if, if they decided to support the process and continue to work with government in the interest of Australians Order. to ensure that they have available uh, a vaccine, Order. which they will, Mr. President, which they will. Order, Senator Waters. Thank you, President. My question is to Minister Cash. Did any of your female staff members advise you? To hire, uh, to not hire. Sorry, can I ask? There was a bit of discussion over here. Sorry about the question list order. Um, sorry, can I ask for the comments again, Senator Waters? My yes, apologies. thanks, President. My question is to Minister Cash. Did any of your female staff members advise you not to hire or to rehire Andrew Hudson, or warn you in any way of his history of poor behaviour towards women? The minister for. Um, Sorry, Senator, the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. President, um, and thank you for the question. Uh, the answer to the question is no. Senator Waters, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, President. I'm happy if the Minister needs to take that first question on notice to assure herself that that is in fact correct. Um, but I shall persist. Did the uh, Minister at any time? tell the Prime Minister or the Prime Minister's office of any concerns that may have been raised about Mr Hudson and his attitude to women? Senator Cash. Uh, well, uh, Mr President, Mr Hudson, if I recall, worked for me four years ago for a short period of time as an assistant media adviser. Um, and the answer is again no. Senator Waters, a final supplementary question. Yes, thank you, President. Did Mr Hudson work for you at any time when Ms Brittany Higgins or Ms Rochelle Miller also worked for you? Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President. In relation to Ms Higgins, no. In relation to Ms Michelle Miller, there may have been a crossover of three or four weeks, but I would need to take advice on that because it was, as I said, around four years ago. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Minister Birmingham. For obvious reasons, cinemas have had to close throughout COVID-19. Most of them have had to rely on JobKeeper for the past year just to tread water. Even though most businesses are getting back to normal because, because of the situation overseas, where, particularly in the US, where there are no blockbuster movies uh, being released, making, uh, making it difficult to attract patronage, is the government looking at a targeted package to support independent cinemas, and what support is being considered if this is the case? The Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I thank uh, Senator Patrick for uh, his question and his interest in an important part of, uh, of the uh, Australian economy and uh, an important part of the small business and medium business community uh, across Australia. And as everybody in this chamber appreciates, Many Australians and many Australian businesses have experienced significant challenges in the past 12 months, uh, and the cinema sector has particularly been one of those. Uh, we are acutely aware of the fact that independent cinemas make up approximately 30 per cent of the cinema exhibition sector in Australia, uh, and that they have uh, been impacted particularly by COVID-19 uh, and especially by uh, the absence of the usual blockbusters, as, uh, as you said, Senator Patrick. Uh, flowing through to them uh, to help attract crowds back in, even as some of those restrictions have been lifted. Uh, it's hard to disaggregate the, uh, the elements of support provided, but across 
the arts and entertainment sector. Some $730 million of assistance has been provided uh, via JobKeeper. Um, other, of course, payments, as uh, the Senate is well aware, have been made uh, to uh, small and medium businesses. Uh, other measures, such as the loss carryback provisions, uh, will provide uh, assistance to many cinemas as well. Um, and, uh, and indeed, we continue to work closely uh, with um, all industry sectors to understand the particular circumstances that they find themselves in. Uh, we uh, have acted in relation to, for example, travel agents uh, providing some, uh, I think, more than a quarter of a billion dollars of, uh, of uh, support there for a sector uh, essentially shut down. Uh, we will keep our approach in the targeted, proportionate way we've indicated and will certainly continue uh, to listen carefully to the independent cin cinema sector uh, and to work with them uh, over the weeks and months ahead. Senator Patrick, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, uh, um, Minister. You will be aware that of the 51 cinemas in South Australia, 41 of them are independent, and I appreciate what you've said about paying JobKeeper. But JobKeeper is about to end. You, you're going to put, you potentially will put people in a position where you've supported them throughout JobKeeper, only to let them fall over a cliff at the end. Is there a package for, specifically for cinemas, and when will you announce it? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. As I said, there's been a, a lot of uh, different targeted measures that, uh, that we've deployed uh, during the course of, uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, some of those targeted measures. Uh, um, launched last year have uh, been as diverse as four sectors, uh, such as exhibiting zoos and aquariums, for example, recognising the unique nature of their circumstances, that although JobKeeper, although JobKeeper provided, pardon the pun, Senator Ayres. Senator Patrick, on a point of order. Just on a point of order, my, my question was directed at independent cinema, cinemas, not at other industries. Is there going to be a package for independent cinemas? I've allowed you to remind the Minister of the Question, Senator Patrick. The Minister has 33 seconds remaining to answer. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. As, uh, as I was saying there, we have um, targeted assistance over and above um, JobKeeper and small business payments and, uh, and other economy-wide measures throughout the course of the pandemic, some of it uh, such as those that I outlined at the height of the pandemic, if you like, others more recently through the course of this year in relation to the travel agency sector. And as I said, in relation to the primary question, uh, we are acutely aware of the particular situation that independent cinemas find themselves in, uh, and we continue to look very carefully at that sector and to engage very closely with it. Well, Senator Patrick, a final supplementary question. The, there is 10 days until uh, JobKeeper finishes and decisions are being made now. I'm aware of two cinemas in regional South Australia who have already made the decision to close and others that are very close. Will the minister, as a South Australian senator and a minister of the government, undertake to personally contact them? Uh, I'll provide details to see exactly what they may need to get them through the, this difficult time. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Um, of, of course, Senator Patrick, I'm always uh, happy to uh, to engage uh, with small businesses, with constituents. Uh, and indeed to work cooperatively with senators across this place to understand uh, particular needs that, uh, that may be there. As I indicated in the previous question, uh, the government is very committed to working with the independent cinema sector uh, and, to, uh, and to ensuring uh, its viability and to understanding the unique circumstances it face. We have uh, already launched various initiatives in relation to getting audiences back into uh, to cinemas. Uh, the, uh, the 26 December initiative by Screen Australia uh, around our Summer of Cinema campaign uh, focused and highlighted a number of Australian titles to try to help uh, create and generate more interest in return to cinemas. Uh, we equally are supporting other parts of the, uh, the arts sector in generating more content, more Australian content, but also attracting more movie production here. Uh, but we're very committed to working with those in independent cinemas, and I'm very happy, as I say, to speak directly with them, Senator Patrick. Senator Bragg. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Employment Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the Minister update the Senate on how today's labour force figures show how the Morrison government's economic recovery plan is supporting Australians into jobs and Australia's economic recovery? Minister for Employment Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. 
Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Bragg for his question. And, uh, Mr. President, the labour force figures that have been released today by the Australian Bureau of Statistics they show that the Australian labour market, and that is, of course, the employers out there, it continues to recover strongly in February 2021. What we saw this uh, last month was employment actually increased by 88,700 over the month, and that exceeded all market expectations. Importantly, all states and territories across Australia recorded a rise in employment over the month. So what you're now seeing is the ending of those COVID restrictions are well and truly seeing the states and territories now uh, create jobs. There are now more than 13 million Australians in work. And what that means, Mr President, is the level of employment is now 3,600 above the pre-COVID level in March 2020. And in fact, it's 876,400 or 7.2 per cent higher than the trough in the labour market recorded in May 2020. Mr President, in terms of job creation in the month of February, the increase in employment over the month, I am pleased to say, was due entirely to a surge in full-time jobs. What you saw was around 89,100 full-time jobs. That's how much are they rose by in February. We now have full-time employment at a record high in Australia of 8,895,000. Uh, women also, as the uh, Minister for Women knows, women accounted for the vast majority of the rise in employment in February. Uh, that was up by 74,100. And what we also see now is that is at a record high uh, of 6,174,200. Mr President, we also saw the unemployment rate drop by half a percentage point. So what we're seeing is a strong Order, recovery Cash, in the labour Senator market. Senator Bragg, a supplementary question. Thank you very much. Minister, how will the government continue to support our labour market to recover from this once-in-a-century economic shock uh, from the COVID-19 pandemic? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, the government's economic recovery plan, described um, as key to saving jobs by the OECD, will, to conti will continue to create employment opportunities in Australia and also to secure Australia's economic um, and labour market future. You know, as we enter the next phase of COVID-19, because we know uh, there is a phase, we need to actually come out of it, we have our $74 billion job maker plan. And that's, of course, putting in place major supports for employers and the Australian workplace. Uh, of course, as the Minister for Skills, I'd like to uh, highlight the government's strong focus, the strong focus on what we've done to support apprentices and trainees throughout Australia. Our supporting apprentices and trainees wage subsidy has now seen over 123,000 apprentices kept on since COVID-19 commenced. And of course, the uh, boosting apprentices commencement has now supported over 100,000 new commencements. Senator Bragg, a final supplementary question. Thank you very much. Uh, as we enter the next stage of our economic recovery from COVID-19, why should Australians have confidence in the resilience of our labour market and the potential of our economic recovery? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, as the Prime Minister and the, the Treasurer say, there is a long road ahead, but the economic outlook is looking optimistic. Uh, when you look at the performance of Australia, we have outperformed all major advanced nations with more Australians in work today uh, than before the crisis. As I said, we now have seen um, in excess of 13 million Australians are now in work, and the level of employment today is actually higher than what it was at the height of the crisis. We continue to see, though, consumer confidence, business confidence and job ads grow to higher levels uh, than before the pandemic. Despite the impacts of COVID-19, the latest ABS data also shows that an additional 46,000 businesses were trading over the year to June 2020. Again, Mr President, what the government is all about is putting in place that right economic framework to ensure that across Australia businesses can prosper, grow and, of course, create more jobs for Australians. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. In my home state of Victoria, more than 410,000 workers and over 130,000 businesses will be affected by the Morrison government ending JobKeeper in just 10 days. 
How many of the more than 410,000 workers will lose their jobs and how many of the more than 130,000 businesses will be forced to close their doors? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks Mr President. I thank Senator Kitching for her question. It's a question that is, is eerily reminiscent of questions that I recall facing at each of the transition points in relation to JobKeeper. When the government announced that there would be a phasing out of JobKeeper after the first six months and we announced the journey to do so, at each of those transition points the opposition would come in here and they would ask questions about indeed what would occur and potentially how many jobs would be lost. And yet at each of those transition points to date, what we have seen is that the number of jobs have kept growing up. That at each of those transition points, more Australian businesses have graduated off of JobKeeper, more Australian employees have graduated off of JobKeeper, and that the number of people employed across Australia has kept going up to the point where, as Senator Cash and I have both told the Senate today, total employment across Australia now stands back at a level in advance of where it was in March 2020. Total employment is back at a level before JobKeeper came into effect. Now we acknowledge, Mr. President, we acknowledge that there will be for some businesses, for some businesses, potential challenges ahead. We've always acknowledged that that would be the case. We have always acknowledged that that would be the case, Mr. President. But what we've sought to do throughout the pandemic is put in place the safeguards to get Australia through the worst of it. And now, as we've come very clearly, very clearly through the worst of the pandemic, through the worst of the economic crisis, we've made those measures more targeted. We've ensured those measures hone in on the parts of order. the Australian economy. Senator, um, Senator Birmingham, I have Senator Kitching on a point of order. On, a relevant, on relevance, Mr President, I asked how many of the more than 410,000 workers will lose their jobs, how many of the more than 130,000 businesses. I'm happy to take a percentage or a number. Senator Kitching, um, I think while the minister is talking about the specific program in question and specifically talking about numbers employed in the labour force, I, I, I can't instruct him how to answer the question, but I do believe he's being directly relevant. There's the opportunity after question time, albeit slightly later than normal, to debate those matters. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks Mr President. Well, as I addressed very clearly and through the answer to this question, we have seen jobs growth continue. The forecasts are for jobs growth to continue. And we will Order, continue Senator Birmingham. to support Time industries. The answer has expired. Senator Kitching, a supplementary question. Thank you. On Tuesday, Victoria's 11 regional tourism boards signed a joint letter to Minister Tian, calling on the Morrison government to urgently add more destinations to its tourism support package. Will the Morrison government now add more destinations in regional Victoria to its tourism support package? Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, our tourism support package, $1.2 billion, some 800,000 half price airfares that we are supporting across the country to get people moving, is a package that we said at the outset, from day one, that we would continue to monitor the impacts across different regions of Australia and target and shift support and subsidy across Australia as necessary. And so we will do that. We are doing it. We will continue to do that through the life of this program. Around, I think it's 46,000 discounted flights per week are being supported under this program. And in doing so, they're going to help to shift many, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Australians around the country, generating more tourism activity, more bed nights, more people booking experiences, more opportunities for Australians to take a break, but also for Australians to support the jobs and small businesses of tourism operators across Australia. And we will keep making sure that package Order. responds Senator Birmingham, as necessary. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Kitching, a final supplementary question. Thank you. And I'm going to read a quote from the Victorian Tourism Industry Council chief, and I don't think she will take great um, satisfaction from your answer to the first supplementary. Ms Mariani has said, and I quote, many operators have said that, that they have already told people that they can't keep them employed. So these are decisions being made right now. People cannot see a way out of this. Why is the Morrison government turning its back on Victorian businesses? Senator Birmingham. 
Well, Mr. President, I, I know that those opposite want to see everything fail. Um, that's their whole modus operandi. It's but what we've seen in the short period of time, what we've seen in the short period of time since this program was announced, was a, have been a significant spike in the number of airline bookings across Australia. A significant spike in relation to people getting back to business, getting back to travelling and making those sorts of bookings around Australia, including very much across regional Australia. We have seen, we have seen airlines report lifts in their bookings. We have seen lifts in bookings elsewhere across the tourism and travel industry. And we have promised that we will continue to adapt this program responsive to the bookings and information and data that we get from the aviation industry and the tourism industry throughout its rollout. This is about us once again implementing a program targeted and responsive to the needs of Australians to protect their Order, businesses Senator and protect Birmingham. their jobs. Senator Canavan. Thank you, uh, Mr President. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Seselja. Can the Minister update the Senate on the potential impacts of the announced early closure of the Yalorn coal-fired power station on the security of electricity supplies in Australia? The Minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Seselja. Uh, thank you very much, and I thank Senator Canavan for a very important question. Um, Yalorn has provided the reliable generation needed to keep energy prices low and the grid secure Order. in Victoria and the national electricity market for decades. As an employer of around 500 staff and an important contributor to the local economy, our thoughts are with the Order. workers, their families and local business owners who rely on the power Order. station for their livelihoods. While the, Commonwealth, while the Commonwealth Government understands this is a commercial decision, the exit of 1,480 megawatts of reliable energy generation brings with it reliability and affordability concerns. As an essential service, the Commonwealth Government expects the market to step up to deliver enough dispatchable generation to keep the lights on and prices low once your lawn closes. While coal exits impact reliability and system security, the major impact for consumers will be the significant increase in prices if not adequately replaced with dispatchable capacity. We've already seen this happen with the closures of uh, Northern in South Australia and most recently Hazelwood in Victoria, where wholesale prices skyrocketed by 85 per cent. The Commonwealth will model the impact of the closure to hold industry to account on the dispatchable capacity needed to ensure affordable, reliable power for consumers. This will deliver needed transparency around the impact of your lawn's closure. We're not going to stand idly by and watch a loss of reliability and affordability. We want to see industry step Order. up, but we also want to see that consumers Order. are properly looked after and we get the Order. affordability and reliability that Victorians Order. deserve. Senator and indeed. Wong that all Australians deserve. What we won't do is risk the stability and affordability of our energy system as those opposite would do. Labor has a 2050 energy policy, but Senator won't explain Rez. how they'll get Senator there. Watt. They won't explain how much it will cost. Labor has tried Senator it before Rennick. and will try it again. We're supporting Order. technology, not taxes. That's Order. how you bring down power prices and deliver Order, reliable Senator energy. Seselja. Order. I will call Senator Canavan when there is order. Order. We've been here a while. We'll be a while longer until, until there's silence. Senator Canavan. Uh, can the minister outline how the Liberal and Nationals government is encouraging investment in reliable coal and gas power generation? Senator Seselja. Senator Seselja. Thank you. Delivering reliable and affordable energy is one of the highest priorities of this government. And in Senator Canavan's home state, we are investing in a number of projects that will help secure the reliable and more affordable energy we need, and we know this will drive further private investment. We're investing in Copper String 2.0 with, with over a thousand kilometres of high voltage transmission line between Mount Isa and Hewenden. Copper String will deliver 750 direct construction jobs and connect North Queensland with national electricity market to help deliver lower cost power. We're also delivering more investment in reliable generation through our underwriting new generation investment program. We've got a 13-point plan to ensure Australian gas is working for all Australians. Those opposite have no energy policy. 
just a plan for more and bigger taxes. We have a plan focused on technology, not taxes. We will protect jobs, we will deliver reliable energy and we will drive down costs left. for households and Order. businesses. Order. Senator Canavan, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you. Uh, can the minister advise the Senate on the government's actions to deliver more reliable and more affordable power to Australians and any risks to increase reliability and affordability for households Order. During and question. businesses? Senator Watt. I've called your name numerous times during this question time. Senator Seselgi. Thank you very much, Mr President. It's great to hear Senator, Senator Costanza is. over there interjecting again. He was a bit quiet. He was a bit quiet yesterday. Uh, but keeping energy prices down and maintaining security. <laughs> Order. Senator Watt. <laughs> thank, thank you, Mr President. Senator Canavan. <laughs> I think the clock hasn't been uh, set for the answer. To him. Um, I think we've gone for about 20 seconds, so I'll set it at 40 seconds. Ten. Oh, okay. We'll, we'll commence it on the vice from the clerk. Give the senator to sell you the full minute. And this is. And honestly, I might have noticed it if there wasn't so much noise in the chamber. Senator to sell you. Oh, thank you, Mr. President. Answer. And. Keeping energy prices down and maintaining secure power supply is central to our COVID economic recovery and is critical to supporting jobs. There are, however, a number of risks to this recovery. What Labor don't understand is that we need sufficient dispatchable energy capacity to keep prices low, keep the lights on and to back up the record investment in renewables. That's why we've set a target for the electricity sector to deliver 1,000 megawatts of new dispatchable energy to replace the Liddell power station before it closes down in 2023. That's why we'll back a gas power Order. plant in the Hunter if the private sector doesn't replace Senator Liddell's Watt. capacity. And that's why we are Senator unlocking Canavan. billions in new investment into our energy system through the te Technology Investment Roadmap. We support technology and totally reject Labor's taxes because their taxes won't keep prices down, they won't deliver uh, for our energy system and they won't protect our economy. Senator McAllister. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Superannuation, Financial Services and the Digital Economy, Senator Hume. Yesterday, in response to a question about the government's plan for victim survivors of domestic violence to fund their own escape plans using their superannuation, the Prime Minister said, and I quote, We've been consulting with various groups around the country. We're listening to those concerns. That measure is now under review. Can the Minister now rule this measure out? The Minister for um, Superannuation Financial Services and the Digital Economy, Senator Hume. Thank you, Mr President. And I thank Senator McAllister for her question and her sincere and enduring interest in the economic welfare of women in retirement. This was a measure that was first raised in the 2018 Women's Economic Security Statement. And we have been actively listening to stakeholders in this area and reflecting on their views. Stakeholders have raised concerns about this proposal. That is true. And we understand that their concerns, and, uh, and as both the Prime Minister and I have said this week, the measure is now under review. And that's exactly, exactly what that means. The measure was in fact originally proposed, you might recall, by HESTA, the super fund that has around 80 per cent of its members as women. Order. And it was in fact not just supported by HESTA but also by the industry superannuation, uh, ind the industry superannuation funds generally. Um, the most important thing here is that we get the safeguards right. Mm -hmm. And if we can't get those safeguards right, we need to be able to um, get the safeguards right. Order. The safeguards need to be in place to ensure that, uh, that women in, that are taking money out of their superannuation to flee a dangerous relationship are not being in any way coerced to do so. If we can't get those safeguards right and if we get the feedback from those frontline workers in particular Senator, who know the difficulty that faces victims fleeing violent relationships every single day, well, the measure simply won't proceed. Mr President, the Morrison government is acting to support women's safety in their homes and in their communities, in their workplaces and online. The Commonwealth has led the way with the national plan to reduce violence against women and their children, which will be succeeded by the national plan next year. 
We have committed more Order. than $1 billion to women and children facing family, domestic and sexual violence since coming to office in 2013. There will be further consultation as we develop the next national action plan to reduce violence against women and their children Order, as Senator the government Hume, engages with key has industry has and families. Senator McAllister, a supplementary question. Thank you. Domestic violence victim survivor Nicole Lee has told the ABC, and I quote, we don't even have any super to tap into. And the other side of that is that we shouldn't be tapping into super to escape from violence. Why does the minister think it is, and I quote, a terrific opportunity to make a woman who wants to leave a violent relationship choose between her financial security and her personal safety? Senator Hume. Thank you very much, Mr. President. In fact, it wasn't just me that said that we wanted to give women an opportunity to leave a violent or menacing relationship. It, in fact, was the CEO of Hester who said that while women already retire with almost half of the super of men, they shouldn't, and they shouldn't have to use their super for this purpose. But family violence is one of the rare situations in which short-term financial needs are more compelling than the need to preserve superannuation for retirement. Order, Senator Hume. I have Senator Wong on a point of order. A point of order direct relevance. The CEO of a super fund is not the minister. The minister was asked about her quote, her quote, her own statement, a terrific opportunity, and I'd ask her to return to the question. Um, Senator Wong, when the question concludes with why does the minister think it is and refers to a quote the minister's made, I think it is also directly relevant if the minister is actually referring to supporting material in that. I'm listening carefully to the answer, um, and, but at the moment I believe that is directly relevant. Senator Hume. Thank you, Mr President. Indeed, it wasn't just me that felt that this was an opportunity to give to women who are fleeing a menacing or dangerous relationship. It was also the CEO of the Hester Superannuation Fund and, indeed, it was Matt Linden the Deputy CEO of Industry Senator Super Wong Australia. On a point of order. Mr President, this is a prior statement the minister has made. I understand your ruling enables you know, some other material, but the, the question goes to comments this minister has made, and ask her to, I would ask her to return to the question. Um, again, Senator Wong, I will carefully review the hand side. I genuinely believe that if someone is being asked why they hold a particular view, it is directly relevant for them to refer to supporting material at, that may have been of persuasion or other matters. Um, but I, I will again review the Hansard in detail and make sure I come back when we next sit. Senator Hume. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Indeed, I am not the only one that believes that this is an opportunity for women to flee a dangerous or menacing relationship. Matt Linden, the Deputy CEO of Industry Super Australia, said allowing access to super in special circumstances could be the difference between someone seeking vital help or not. Order, Senator or Hume. Not. Time for the answers expired. Order. Order. Senator McAllister has the call for a final supplementary question. Thank on my you. right, on my left and right now, order. Senator McAllister. Domestic Violence New South Wales CEO Delia Donovan has said, and I quote, it's absolutely not okay in terms of creating further debt and poverty later on for women who are already affected by the gender pay gap. One in three women has no super. Most women under the age of 45 have a super balance of less than $45,000. I ask again, why does the minister think it would be a terrific opportunity to create further debt and poverty for women leaving violent relationships? Senator Hume. Thank you, Mr. President. And I answer again that this is an opportunity for women to leave a dangerous or, or, or menacing relationship. And it wasn't just me that thought that this is a good idea. In fact, it was not just the CEO of Hester, not just Matthew, Matthew Linden, the deputy CEO of Industry Super Australia, but it was in fact the board of Hester. Can I tell you who was on the board of Hester? The, the, the board of Hester are representatives Order. of the ACTU. Right. The ACTU were on the board of Hester. Order. The ACTU are on the board of Hester. Who else is on the board of Hester that thought that this was a very good idea? Let me tell you. Order. In fact, the United Workers Union are also represented on that board. Order. I believe that's Senator Walsh's and Senator, Senator Watts' union. 
The Health Services Union is represented on the board of Hester. I believe that might be oh, Senator Kitching. Well, I know you had something to do with the Health Services Union. I'm not sure whether you're a member anymore. Can I also tell you that the Australian Services Union, I think that's your union, Senator Wong. Is that not correct? I think Order. your union Senator also Hume, thought that that was a good idea. Time for the answer has expired. Order. 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 I will. Order. I'm order. Order. We will stay here and run down the clock until there's silence, so I can call Senator Askew. Senator Askew. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is also to the Minister for Superannuation, Financial Services and the Digital Economy, Senator Hume. Can the minister confirm that there is up to $13.8 billion in lost and unclaimed superannuation waiting for Australians to find, and also advise what measure the Morrison government has put in place to make it easier for people to claim their lost super? including in my home state of Tasmania. The Minister for Superannuation, Financial Services and the Digital Economy, Senator Hume. Well, thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Askew for this question, because this is indeed a terrific opportunity. <laughs> it's exactly right. There is $13.8 billion in lost and unclaimed superannuation that's simply waiting to be claimed by ordinary Order. Australians. In Order fact, on my right. Senator Hume to continue. In fact, New South Wales tops the nation in unclaimed amounts. There's around $3.4 billion, and New South Wales holds six of the top 10 postcodes. Mr. President, in my home state of Victoria, that follows with $2.2 billion in unclaimed or lost super. Then your home state, Senator Watt, $1.9 billion is sitting there. Western Australia, $1.2 billion. South Australia, with $800 million and ACT with $230 million. and Indeed, even the Northern Territory has around $160 million in lost and unclaimed super waiting to find a home. And Mr President, Senator Askew's home state of Tasmania is also on this list with $135 million in lost and unclaimed super. And In fact, beautiful Launceston, where Senator Askew is a terrific representative, uh, that ranks number one in her state. That's the number one postcode in her state for lost and unclaimed amounts. Mr President, this is Australians' hard-earned wages, and it could be from your first job, from a casual job that you held years ago and forgot all about. You may have changed your name, you may have changed your address, you may have lost the, your super fund uh, from many years ago uh, because it's been inactive for a period of time. But by law, your super fund is now, thanks to the Morrison government, required to transfer certain amounts to the ATO, which then becomes unclaimed super money. Unlike super funds, the ATO does not charge fees, and thanks to the reforms passed by this government, it proactively consolidates any unclaimed money into an eligible and active account wherever possible. So I encourage all senators to review the lost amounts data that, uh, and share that news with their, with their constituents. Senator, ask you a supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister please explain to the Senate how easy it is for Australians to find their lost superannuation? Senator Hume. Thank you, Mr. President. It is, in fact, very easy to find your lost or unclaimed super, and it is also very quick. Quicker than it takes to order a cup of coffee, you can, or you can find out if a slice of that $13.8 billion belongs to you. All you have to do is jump onto the MyGov website, link to the ATO portal, and click the Manage My Super link. It is that easy. So if you've lost or you've forgotten your super, it'll be sitting there waiting for you. You can scroll through and you can actually consolidate your lost and forgotten amounts into your active primary super fund, all for free, making sure that your super works much harder for you. It is that simple. And the government has requested that the ATO do that work on your behalf. So there's no need to search, there's no need to hand over information. If, you've forgotten, if you have forgotten super, that the ATO will use data matching technology uh, that only the ATO has to match your lost super to you. So, um, and right, that happens all right on your MyGov account. Senator, ask you a final supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister also outline what additional actions are being taken by the Morrison government to proactively reunite working Australians with their lost super? Senator Hume. 
Thank you again, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Askew. Yes, I am very proud to inform the Senate that the Morrison government has already, in fact, reunited Australians with billions of dollars in lost and unclaimed superannuation. And data released by the ATO for the financial year ending June 2020 shows that the Morrison government's reforms have had an enormous impact on the retirement balances of millions of Australians, reducing unclaimed super by around $7 billion compared to the 30th of June 2019. In just seven months, $7 billion in lost and unclaimed super has been reunited back into the accounts of hardworking Australians. This is on top of the Morrison government's reforms that they have, of the incredibly effective protecting your super reforms that allowed that for that proactive reuni reuniting of super um, with lost and unclaimed super, and also capped fees on low balances and inactive accounts, making your super work so much harder for you. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Yesterday, the Prime Minister confirmed that advice was being sought regarding the scope of the Attorney General's portfolio responsibilities, which would be removed, which would be removed from the Attorney General on his return to work. When was this advice sought, and by whom? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, thanks, Mr. President. Look, those are details that I do not have to hand. I'd have to take those on notice for the Senator as to specifically when it was sought and specifically who made the request, um, as, uh, as we have outlined to the Senate uh, quite clearly. Uh, the uh, government uh, sought that advice out of an abundance of caution. Um, we have, uh, out of a further abundance of caution, uh, acted uh, in a number of interim ways uh, in relation to engagement that the uh, Attorney-General um, or his office uh, would have on matters as they pertain particularly to uh, the Federal Court uh, and to the Australian Broadcasting Corporation um, pending the receipt of that advice. Um, I'm not aware of updates to, uh, to uh, any of those precautions that, uh, that have or are being taken at present, uh, but of course, as, uh, as all senators are aware, uh, in the interim at this point in time, uh, Senator Cash is, uh, is uh, acting as the Attorney-General and is therefore without any risk of conflict in a position to be able to fulfil uh, all of the uh, normal duties of the Attorney General um, in relation to uh, any ongoing arrangements that uh, may be necessary uh, when the Attorney General returns to work. Uh, it would be the intention um, of, uh, of the government, I'm sure, that, uh, that the Assistant Minister of the Attorney General, Senator Stoker, uh, would, uh, would um, undertake uh, those relevant duties as is appropriate to ensure uh, that, uh, that all duties are uh, fully handled. It's, uh, it's not, Mr. President, uh, unusual in relation to any potential for a perceived conflict of interest to exist, uh, for uh, other ministers to be asked to handle matters in relation to such a perceived conflict of interest, uh, but the government is acting cautiously uh, and, uh, and awaits that advice on this matter. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Yes, I do have a supplementary. Did this request include advice on whether Attorney General Porter is a fit and proper person to return to the position at all? And if not, why not? Senator Birmingham. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Well, the advice the government is seeking is, uh, is exactly the nature that, uh, that I have outlined. It relates to appropriately taking precautions in relation to ensuring uh, that there is uh, no real or potential for perceived conflict of interest to exist uh, whilst the Attorney-General undertakes defamation proceedings that he has publicly announced. Uh, the Attorney-General, like any member of parliament, like any Australian, Order. has, has Mr. President, uh, a right to be able to uh, use the existing laws of the land uh, to be able to pursue uh, a defamation allegation, and in and in and in doing so, Mr. President, and in doing so, an independent judicial process will no doubt have an opportunity to hear the claims that are made uh, and to and to ensure uh, that through that process uh, the Senator matters Birmingham are properly for the independent. Has expired. Senator, um, Senator Gallagher, a supplementary <laughs> Thank question. you, Mr. President. Yes, uh, thank you. Why should the Australian people accept a part-time Attorney-General on a full-time salary? 
Senator Birmingham. Uh, Mr. Mr. President, as I said, if the senator had listened to the primary question, it is not unusual. It is not unusual, and there will be many precedents on all sides of politics that ministers, if there is any chance of a potential for a conflict of interest to exist, that there be acting arrangements put in place in relation to those particular responsibilities and duties. And Mr. President, I have no doubt. I have no doubt that the Attorney General and the Minister for Workplace Relations, when he returns to work, and will continue to pursue the type of work that, uh, that the government has seen, indeed only today, with the passage of legislation through this chamber that is ensuring greater certainty for casual employees, greater certainty uh, for small businesses, and avoiding the risk of some $39 billion, $39 billion of potential liabilities that many business organisations and representatives said could have pushed many businesses Order. over the Senator edge. Senator Birmingham, President. time for the answer. Mr. Mr. President, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Senator Bill, could I quickly table a document? Just, I want to join with the speaker in the other place on tabling a statement in respect of Commonwealth Day earlier this month, and I include in that, as is customary, a message from Her Majesty the Queen as head of the Commonwealth. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, I seek leave to move a motion relating to the consideration of legislation today. It is leave granted. It is, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I move the motion as circulated. In doing so, as I had indicated earlier in the day, uh, the government is bringing forward legislation, the Archives and Other Legislation Amendment Bill 2021, uh, which will uh, seek to achieve the very uh, important um, um, outcome of guaranteeing to any individuals who participate uh, in the inquiry and review into Parliament's workplace practices uh, that is being undertaken by the Sex Discrimination Commissioner, Commissioner Kate Jenkins, uh, through the Australian Human Rights Commission, uh, that their participation can be done with the utmost confidence uh, of its confidentiality, uh, that such legislation uh, will be able uh, to provide any existing or former staff member in this place, or indeed any other individual seeking to make submission, the confidence that if they make a submission, if they participate in any way in that review, uh, and they wish for their information uh, to remain confidential, it will remain confidential. I, uh, I thank uh, various parties for their um, advocacy in relation to this matter. Uh, it certainly was the government's intention at the outset in using the Human Rights Commission uh, that we believed there were sufficient protections in place to guarantee confidentiality. This legislation will, if you like, provide um, uh, an absolute additional layer of safeguard to that, uh, such, that uh, such that I hope everyone can engage in doing so. The government recognises the urgency of passing such legislation to give that confidence, hence the hours motion that I am proposing. question is, Speaking to the motion, Senator Waters. Yes, I seek leave to make a short statement. I can speak to the motion, Senator Waters. Oh, thank you. Uh, look, I'll just flag that whilst we don't like the practice of last-minute hours motions, given the content of the bill that is uh, being sought to be uh, passed through this chamber today, and we understand early in the House next week, given that it will facilitate uh, staffers and former staffers providing confidential evidence to the Jenkins Culture Review, then on that basis alone we will be supporting this. And I might add we have been seeking this fix to be drafted all week, as has, I understand, uh, the opposition. So uh, we look forward to actually seeing a copy of that draft bill, which I would very much like to receive very soon, uh, and then uh, we will agree to this hour's motion. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Birmingham be agreed to. Those of that opinion say, sorry, Senator Patrick. Thank you. Can I? You can speak to the motion, Senator. Yeah, Patrick. thank you. Um, I just wouldn't mind if uh, Senator Birmingham would would uh, clarify one thing. I, I haven't seen the bill either. I don't know the text of the bill. Uh, I, I'm uh, broadly in support of it. Um, I would like to know, in the circumstances of the bill carves out um, all submissions made to the Human Rights Commission, would the government make, give an undertaking that a government submission would be released, released uh, administratively? Senator Birmingham can sort of seek leave to make another contribution now. And he can close the debate now so, and answer that query. Unless anyone else wants to speak, I'll call Senator Birmingham. There will also be
an opportunity to debate the bill albeit briefly at the time it comes forward. Senator Patrick. Senator Birmingham. Th th thanks, Mr. President. Mr. President, I, I, I am seeking to make sure that uh, the details of the bill are shared with, uh, with minor parties, crossbench senators uh, and indeed all senators as quickly as possible, uh, and I trust that will be the case. Uh, of course, Senator Patrick, once it is shared with you, I will happily engage in relation to any details or concerns you may have. It's certainly the government's intention uh, that any individual who wishes to make public their submission obviously retains the right to do so. In, in relation to any government submissions, uh, I would, uh, would anticipate that they will be made public, uh, barring any features of particular personal confidentiality or the like that may be contained within them. The question is the motion moved by Senator Birmingham be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Thank you. We're now proceeding to motions to take note. Senator Waters. Yes, thank you, President. I seek leave to, no to take note of the response uh, given to me uh, by uh, Senator Cash uh, to my question of her. Now, I asked Minister Cash about uh, staff members that had been employed in her office that yesterday uh, were revealed as uh, having disgusting attitudes to women and frequently sharing those in the workplace. Now, folk might realise that yesterday there was an ABC article where three Liberal staffers alleged that a particular Liberal staff member, a man, um, routinely subjected them to disgusting comments, generally displayed misogynistic behaviour. Now, last night in the Tasmanian parliament, uh, Greens leader Cassie O'Connor uh, believed that this was in fact the same man who had directed a vile slur to her while she was in the uh, process of trying to give a uh, press conference. Uh, <laughs> It's very interesting that the uh, problem males in the Liberal Party don't tend to get the sack until someone goes public with their disgusting behaviour. The behaviour is tolerated and swept under the carpet, and they're cycled through various offices rather than actually being uh, attended to and sacked, or at the very least uh, trained and uh, brought into this century rather than the 1950s, where they evidently belong. Now, <laughs> We've had successive female staffers in this place raise concerns about these issues. What more do they have to do to be listened to? These staff members yesterday had to go to the media and then they needed a, a member of parliament in a different parliament to use parliamentary privilege to identify this person before he was then asked to resign. And he was asked to resign. He wasn't sacked. He was asked to resign, which no doubt has implications for any sort of severance, severance or, or payment package that he might get. Women keep raising these concerns, and so far it seems like the Liberal Party is doing uh, sweet nothing about it until such time as the media spotlight is turned upon them. Now, Brittany Higgins's alleged rapist was asked to leave. He wasn't. He wasn't fired. He also was asked to leave. Uh, he got a pretty well-paying job soon after in some fancy lobbying firm. There were no consequences for him. Meanwhile, Ms Higgins, one of the bravest people uh, that I've uh, seen in recent years, uh, had to take the difficult decision uh, to choose her own uh, personal safety ahead of any possibility of career advancement for her in the Liberal Party. Now, Andrew Hudson, who was the staff member named by Greens leader uh, in the Tasmanian parliament yesterday and who we understand is also the staff member that those three Liberal uh, staff women were complaining of misogynistic treatment, he's been cycled around different offices. He started off in Minister Cash's office. He then got uh, recycled into the Tasmanian parliament and he came back in to work for Minister Sukar. Honestly, does nobody do anything when female staffers raise concerns about uh, sexist remarks uh, and worse sexist behaviour in the workplace? This man was well known to have disgusting attitudes and frequently give voice to them, and yet nothing was done. He just kept getting moved around. It seems like Minister Cash's office is the place you go where you might be a political problem uh, for this government, whether or not you're a perpetrator or a victim survivor. Well, 
do better, folks. And I'm glad that we now have um, the Jenkins review, which there's now going to be a hasty patch up of a, a loophole that should have been uh, non existent in the first place. But it's, it is deeply unsatisfactory that this government does nothing about sexism and misogyny until oh, yes. the media spotlight is on them. It's no surprise they don't have many women in their ranks because their culture is well known. It's toxic, it's sexist, and it's misogynistic. It is unsafe. So I'm very pleased that those uh, female staff members and, and Ms Brittany Higgins and Ms Rochelle Miller um, have the courage to come forward, but it shouldn't take media scrutiny to do the right thing. Clean up your own backyard. The Prime Minister keeps trying to get off these issues, but he is sending the signal that not only does he not believe women and he doesn't realise rape is a problem until his wife tells him, but that he will accept this sort of behaviour in the workplaces that he presides over. We need leadership from the Prime Minister. He needs to say that this behaviour is not going to be tolerated in his party. Uh, otherwise, we'll see more and more media stories until the government finally gets the message that women have had enough. The question is the motion moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? I will call the clerk. First moment notifications have been lodged as follows. The general business notice of motion number 1070, standing in the name of Senator Hanson, for today, postponed to the 11th of May 2021. And committees have lodged extension notifications as shown at item 7 on today's order of business. I remind senators the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, we shall now move to the discovery of formal business. So I'll move to business of the Senate matter. I'll go through in the order there on the notice paper today. So I'll commence at business of the Senate matter number one. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that business of the Senate mo notice of motion number one, proposing a reference to the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade References Committee relating to TPI payments, uh, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Kitching. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. Eyes have it. Senator Kitching, number two. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask the business of the Senate notice of motion number two, proposing a reference to the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade References Committee relating to Defence Force recruitment and death benefits, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Kitching. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Are we in a position to handle government business? That, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, um, thanks, Mr. President. Uh, I ask that government business notice of motion number one relating to the hours of meeting and routine of business in budget week be taken as formal Is because I haven't moved enough hours motions already this, uh, today. <laughs> Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Birmingham. I thank the Senate and I move the motion. Question Is that motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Government business motion number two was dealt with earlier today. Thank you. I'll now consider go to the general business motions. Um, Senator Lambie is someone in a position. Senator Patrick, motion number 1071. Uh, before asking that this, uh, thank you, Mr. President. Before asking that this motion be taken as formal, I, I wish to inform the chamber that Senator Kakoni will also sponsor the motion. And then I ask that business notice of motion number 1071 be taken. Uh, as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none. Senator Patrick. I move the motion on behalf of uh, uh, Senator Lambie and others. Senator Dunningham. Yeah, I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thanks, Mr. President. Um, the National Commissioner for Defence and Veterans Suicide Prevention Bills that are currently before the Senate that give effect to the Prime Minister's announcement that the inquiry into defence and veterans suicide prevention will have inquiry powers broadly equivalent to a uh, Royal Commission, while also being established as an enduring function. Royal Commissions are time limited and do not have an ability to monitor the implementation of their recommendations. In contrast, the National Commissioner will be able to monitor the implementation in order to ensure accountability and build on prevention and defence and veteran wellbeing strategies into the future. The bills also provide a range of improvements compared to the Royal Commissions Act to ensure the National Commissioner has appropriate powers. The question is that motion number 1071 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. 
Senator Roberts isn't present, so I'll move to. Is someone in a position to move the motion 1073 in the name of Senator Bragg? Senator Davey. Uh, I ask that general business notice of motion number 1073 relating to the Select Committee on Financial Technology and Regulatory Technology be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator. I move Davey. the motion. Question is that motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Let's seek a quick advice from the clerk. Senator Gallagher, um, I'm not sure, because there is no general business debate this afternoon, I was wondering whether you wanted to move your motion. Move the motion. Yeah. Yep. Senator, Senator Urquhart. Thank you, um, Mr President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 1074 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. There is. Oh, no. Oh. Okay. I'll start taking my notes again. Um, 1074. All right, we'll get to 1075 in the name of Senator Brown. Senator Urquhart. Thank you. I ask the general business notice of motion number 1075 be taken as formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? Yeah. Oh, no. 1076. Senator Urquhart, can we do 1076? I ask the general business notice for motion number 1076 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? Let's go to 1077, Senator Kitching. General business notice of motion number 1077 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Kitching. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. Leave is granted for one minute. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. The order for production of documents misunderstands how vaccinations are recorded in Australia. The Australian Immunisation Register is the unifying national system used to monitor immunisation coverage and individual immunisation status, including for COVID-19 vaccines. Australians will have uh, proof of COVID-19 vaccination through their individual immunisation history statement. The statement can be accessed digitally or in hard copy. The, uh, these statements are already used to determine eligibility for some family assistance payments, as well as childcare and school enrolment in some states. The total number of vaccinations are being publicly reported by the Department of Health and are updated regularly and available at health.gov.au. question is the motion number 1077 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The question is that motion number 1077 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart teller for the ayes, Senator Smith teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 32, noes 28. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Um, Senator Roberts, uh, sorry, Senator Roberts, you weren't here before, so can we jump back to your matter number 1072? Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion 1072 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Roberts. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Four minutes. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. Question is that motion number 1072 in the name of Senator Roberts be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Roberts teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 3, noes 44. I understand Senator Roberts would like to seek the call. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr President. I seek leave to make a two-minute statement. Leave is not granted. I could now move to 1078. Sorry, Senator Roberts. I'm aware that I can move a contingent notice to suspend standing orders, so I again seek to make leave to make a short statement. Leave is not granted. I so you can seek to suspend standing orders if you wish, Senator Roberts, but you can't speak to that motion. Is that so much of the standing suspended as would prevent that senator making make, prevent me making that statement? Question is that motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The noes have it. So we'll move to matter number one zero seven eight in the name of Senator O'Neill. Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the matter stands in my name, that of Senators Pratt, Farrell, Faruqi, McGrath. I also seek to add Senator Perrin Davies' name to the matter. Um, I ask that general business notice of motion number 1078 be taken as formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There is. I'll add it to my list. Senator Steele John, number 1079. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion. Oh, uh, no, notice of Sorry. I ask the general business notice of motion number 1079 uh, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Steele John. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. A short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thanks, Mr. President. Um, Australia is uh, strongly committed to an effective global response to climate change. But the only way to deliver serious reductions in global emissions is through collaborating on low emissions technologies to achieve technical and commercial parity. 
Protectionism and taxes are not the answer. We're on track to meet and beat our 2030 target, and our emissions have fallen faster than many developed country peers. The Prime Minister has also said very clearly. Order, oh, I forgot Senator I shouldn't even listen to you. You seriously bring nothing to this place. You really don't, mate. Senator Wish Wilson. You haven't. You never will. It's order. The Prime Minister has also said very clearly that our goal is to reach zero net emissions as soon as possible and preferably by 2050. The question is the motion moved by Senator Steele John be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. no. The noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
lock the doors. The question is that motion number 1079 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Seawitt teller for the ayes, Senator Urquhart teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 9, noes 39. The matter is resolved in the negative. Could we come to the final two matters, 1080, Senator Mackenzie and others? Mr President, I ask that General Business notice of motion number 1080 relating to farm efficiency projects be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? We come to 1081, Senator Canavan and others. Uh, I ask that general business notice of motion number 1081 relating to the New South Wales coal industry be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Canavan. Hello. Great win for the coal industry. I, I move the motion standing in my name in the names of Senator Mackenzie, Davey, McDonald and McMahon. The question is that motion be agreed to. Senator Faruqi. Seek leave to make a one-minute statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. The Greens oppose this motion. Another day, another motion from the National Party spruiking coal. You are a broken record. The Hunter Valley community deserves better than to be wheeled out as fodder for the stunts by the Nationals, the party of the coal lobby. The people of the Hunter Valley know there is no future in coal. They know the only reliable thing about coal is that it will deepen the climate crisis, it will poison land, water and air, and it will end up a stranded asset. Order. The, community, the community isn't interested in your love letters to the coal industry. They want to see a coherent plan for a clean, healthy, jobs-rich future where no one is left Order. behind in a just transition Order. away from coal. The question is, the motion moved by Senator Canavan and others, 1081, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required? Ring the bells for one minute.
Lock the doors. The question is that motion number 1081 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Smith, tell her for the ayes, and Senator Seawitt, tell her for the noes.